Imagine if you were addicted to a game and played it for 10 years just to reach the final boss room. And now, upon arriving, you discover that it was a test. A test to determine if you are truly deserving of participating in that world. And now, you have become the barbarian you chose to complete this game. This is the story of our protagonist, a guy who has always been very weak and spent much of his time in the hospital. He has always been addicted to game, much like me. But he was getting frustrated because good games weren't being released as they used to. Finally, he stumbled upon a forum where a new game was being discussed. It was said that, unlike other games, this one forced the player to do 100% of all the work. Dungeon and Stone, an indie RPG with 2D graphics. Initially, the protagonist wasn't thrilled because the game was only available in English. But since it was free, he decided to give it a chance. When choosing a character, there were the classes human, dwarf, Elf Barbarian and furry There was also a class with three question marks that the protagonist didn't know if it was an option to choose randomly or if it was a secret character. The protagonist ended up choosing anyone since he didn't expect to play this game much and ended up picking the barbarian. Looking at the game, it seemed pretty crappy, but the protagonist got hooked to the point of not even realizing the hours passing. A complete addict. In this game, there are both unique classes and classes that are total garbage. You also have to ally with an NPC, and when you die, you have to start all over again. In the beginning, it was kind of cool, but then he just kept dying and dying, getting frustrated. But he didn't give up. He started playing in the hospital, then became a civil servant, even graduated from college, got a job, and throughout all this time, he always played Dungeon and Stone. Yet, he kept dying. Nine years passed. And now, finally, he reached the final boss room. He made it to the abyss gate of course the protagonist was overjoyed with this achievement and celebrated a lot even asking if anyone else had reached where he had considering he sacrificed nine long years of his life for it now comes the burning question enter the boss room yes or no and when he selects yes because obviously he's going to enter right the guy spent nine years grinding giving his life to the game is he really going to say no now the game warns him that he might not come back asking if he's sure he wants to enter of course this just adds more entry, making it seem like the game is a bit threatening, you know? After selecting yes, the game starts loading, and the protagonist starts thinking about how the boss will be. Finally, the game notifies him that he has reached the abyss, that the tutorial is complete. The protagonist is dumbfounded that the game treats this as a tutorial, and starts getting frustrated again because now the game is written in Korean. The protagonist really seems like the class he chose at the beginning, pissed off at everything. He truly looks like a barbarian. After the game does the user check lights start emanating from his monitor lights that covered him and made him feel a lot of pain and he was completely engulfed by the monitor his consciousness was fading away congratulations young warriors today all of you will leave this sacred place and become true warriors it was at that moment he realized everything had changed torches instead of light bulbs wherever he looked there were handsome muscular barbarians moreover there was an old man shouting for them to grab weapons that suited them best instantly the protagonist starts questioning if this is the introduction of a game. His body seems fine, but rough hands, hard muscles, and tattoos. This movement, the gamer protagonist had truly become a barbarian, until suddenly, the old man starts speaking again, saying that those who are called should step forward. He begins by calling the third son of Van and Carrick. The young man approaches the old man and ends up choosing a weapon, a double-headed axe. With this, it is announced that he is now a warrior. The next to be called is the second daughter of Fenelene, Aina, and so, little by by little, they chose their armaments. May the grace of Raftonia be with you, young warriors! And only then did the protagonist understand that he is truly inside Dungeon and Stone, a barbarian, the class he had chosen, the class he was playing just a moment ago, that's what he has become. While he wonders how this happened, someone says it can't be true. Tarzan, completely scared, says they are in Dungeon and Stone. He just wants to know how they ended up there. This led the protagonist to understand that this guy is different from the other barbarians. It seems he wasn't the only one 
one to enter this game. Who opened their mouth? Was it you? The protagonist, completely shocked, shouted that it wasn't him, even getting angry with the guy who actually yelled. And when the dude looks forward, so it was you. Tarzan quickly started asking if they are in Dungeon and Stone. Don't say anything more. The old man stepped right in front of him. The son of Kajua ORM has been possessed by the spirit of evil. Erase from your memories what this spirit said. Let's continue with the ceremony. With just that, the protagonist already understood a lot. Information number one. People like him who entered the game are spirits of evil. Information two. You'll die if someone finds out. And the third information is that his head could have been rolling on the ground right now. Fourth son of Senek, step forward. All this situation made the protagonist soil his pants. As one by one, the others were called. But the question here is, the protagonist doesn't know his own name. As more and more people were called, the protagonist came up with a plan. He must move two seconds after someone's name is called and no one moves until. Son of Jandel, Bjorn. One, two. Two seconds had passed after the name was announced. Until finally, the protagonist decided to step forward. And we also discovered that his name is Bjorn, son of Jandel. And we have to agree, right folks? This game is on hard mode. The protagonist steps forward, faces the guy, both glaring at each other angrily. The old man instructs him to choose any weapon he wants. Man, man, this old guy here is really starting to look like the future villain. There are various weapons for him to choose from, and the chosen weapon. Even the old man looks a bit suspicious when he sees it because it's literally a shield. This is the best option according to the protagonist. Meanwhile, outside, the computer was updating itself, increasing the overall level of the object by plus 24. The information was sent to the administrator. These are your current statistics. And so, according to the protagonist, when he first picked Barbarian, he chose the Great Sword because it was insane. However, there was a big problem. He kept dying like a piece of crap. Even the monsters were confused, and he just kept dying and dying. So, he tried two-handed axes, maces, hammers, anything he could, but in the end, it was always the same. He entered berserker mode regardless of the weapon and died again. Then, one day, he was walking through the city when he spotted a shield. The shield is something else. Barbarians are a class with great vitality and strength, excellent for being a tank. In the beginning, it was challenging since he spent time learning skills because of the shield, but later on, the stronger monsters fell before him, and he was literally unharmed. In other words, this was a completely overpowered class. That explains why he chose the shield before. Now that the ceremony is over, the gates have opened and the barbarians must go straight into the labyrinth. The city where the labyrinth is located is called Lapdonia and with the leader's order, they headed inside, everyone running desperately together. However, whether they know where they're going is another question, right? Until suddenly, the guy who was leading everyone turns around out of nowhere and says he got lost. Everyone gets pissed, which leads the poor guy to resign from the temporary leader position. So Einar, the second daughter of Fnelen, takes over leader. If you just look at her face, she seems like a normal waifu. But if you look at her whole body, she looks like a wardrobe. The protagonist just observes the situation until she announces that she got lost too. She looks downcast and the protagonist starts thinking that it can't stay like this. But he also can't stand out too much. Then he pulls her aside. Where do you think he's going armed at this time of night? It's only then that she understands what the protagonist meant and she rushes to tell everyone that she now knows the way to the labyrinth. Sometime later, they indeed found the entrance to the labyrinth, but the protagonist began to wonder if it's the right decision to enter now. He was seriously thinking about leaving the barbarian group. He had been sick his whole life in the other world and never picked fights. So can he really go in and kill monsters in there? Well, at the very least, he has to pay the game taxes since Dungeon and Stone has that system. In fact, after the age of 20, those who don't pay the taxes are literally killed. One way to earn money is by entering the labyrinths and fighting monsters. Another way is to have a humble job, working in bars, markets, etc. However, there's a small problem. He is a barbarian, and barbarians have a reputation for being wild and destructive. This is due to a game setting, but in return, they receive weapons right from the start of the game. The problem here is that the labyrinth opens only once a month, and now, literally, there are only 10 minutes left before it closes. He's kind of trapped until this time. Then, it's she who pulls him, telling him that they have to enter now as the portal is getting smaller. He just tells her to go ahead, and he'll catch but before going, she thanks him. He says it's not necessary, but she says she wants to know how she can become as wise as him since she has never seen an intelligent barbarian like him and wants to be like him. Well, she pretty much has to be born again into another race, right? But as he doesn't want to be mean to her, he tells her to think and act normally. She happily thanks him, saying that if he comes back alive from the labyrinth, she will reward him. And hey, folks, could it be what I and you are thinking? Is there going to be some barbarian?
polarity between them. However, what stuck in the protagonist's mind was coming back alive. Barbarians in this game are not afraid of death, they don't care about it. So, the protagonist asks if she's also afraid of dying. She thinks for a moment and asks if that isn't obvious. Of course, she's afraid, but they are natural warriors. If you don't know how to fight bad luck, this kind of made him understand that he will have to go into the labyrinth. So, that's it. They'll see each other inside the labyrinth or not. But being a barbarian, he learns to overcome fear. And now he's heading inside, right folks? You entered the first floor, Crystal Cove. Oh, and I'll let you know, the protagonist is not a crybaby, okay? He's a man of few words. Now inside the dungeon, he literally can't see anything. And when we talk about dungeon and stone, the protagonist is a veteran. That means he knows there should be crystals on the walls that illuminate at least some part of the past. So he realized he ended up being sent straight to the dungeon of darkness. And this was something that had never happened to him in his nine years of playing the game. So, the guy starts to walk and feeling the walls. Slowly, he moves, leaning on them. And just when he thinks he's going too slow, the guy fell into one of those bear traps. Man, that must hurt just a little bit. The guy almost bit himself in pain, but he had to stay silent, since the enemy could be nearby. And guess what? The protagonist was not wrong, right? Look at the little devil lurking there. The worst part is that they are sneaky. They only come at you when you're weakened enough. The protagonist starts removing the trap, complaining that they should provide leather shoes, not sandals. But then he gets mad at himself for complaining, and at the same time starts shouting for them to come at him. That's what he wants. He stands up even though he can't feel his leg because of the trap's poison. He gets even more pissed, calling the goblin for a fight. In fact, he starts getting desperate, insulting the goblin. And the worst part is that at that moment, the protagonist heard the creature's footsteps. What led him to understand that insulting the creature really works. So, he decides to pretend he's fleeing. He walks, the creature walks, he stops, and the creature stops too. Seeing this, the protagonist decides to change plans. He falls, and falls literally with everything, just to trick the goblin. The the creature stays there from a distance, just watching. Did he really die? I was thinking, what is the creature going to do, you know? And the rascal starts throwing stones at the protagonist's head to see if he's alive. Ah. And obviously, this already gets our barbarian completely nervous. And I think this goblin throwing stones is smarter than the other barbarians lost trying to find the labyrinth. Until the goblin gets closer, and the protagonist makes a big mistake. He misses the blow, and even worse, he sees the goblin laughing, mocking him. Then, his blood boils, and his body body even starts moving on its own. He hits the goblin. That must have completely blown the poor goblin away. And folks, this is the true strength of a barbarian. He is completely insane. The goblin had been lifeless for a while, but with bloodshot eyes, he continued pounding the goblin. By defeating this goblin, he gained plus one XP, and slowly the little creature's corpse began to disappear, just like in a game, leaving behind only a small crystal. This is used as currency here in Dungeon and Stone. It's a ninth grade magical gem, and its price is exactly that of a piece of bread. Now it's clearer than ever, this is truly a world with dungeons and monsters, a world with familiar landscapes and different game races, all things he knows very well. This is the game he played for 9 years, but if this is his new reality, he will only know if he dies. And with this trail of blood, it doesn't seem too far from happening. And I have to admit that chapter 4 of this work was just that, the guy crawling around, losing ketchup everywhere. He must have dragged himself for about 10 miles. I know there was a moment when he even saw a light at the end of the cave and started going crazy alone, probably because of the ketchup loss, right folks? And when he was almost giving up, he spotted a group, which actually spotted him back. At this point, the protagonist was almost dying from hemorrhage, and as he's left with less than 2% of life, he gained one permanent sanity point. So, the protagonist is there trying to speak but can't because he's all broken, and the guy wants to know if he's a beginner. But it doesn't make sense for a beginner to have arrived before them there. The protagonist starts getting pissed, even wanting to punch those who are helping him. But the guy remains calm, even giving a little smile. But in reality, he turns around and asks if Urshan can heal the barbarian. The protagonist thinks, do they have a priestess in the team? Now I'm saved, right? But the darn Urshan simply refuses out of the blue. The guy who seems to be the leader of the group says he was already expecting that. But then he asks another member for a potion since he has many. The guy just asks if he doesn't have any more divine power. But he says they can sell the use of that power outside and give a potion to the barbarian. 
Valerian, and here is the potion. The guy just warns that since it's not divine power, it's going to hurt a bit, and the protagonist just wants that potion before he dies. So, the guy pours the potion on his rotten foot, and due to the healing effect, the body begins to regenerate quickly, but along with that came the pain. The protagonist starts screaming in pain, but not long after, the man's foot was as good as new. He even managed to stand up already, but obviously, all of this didn't come for free. The guy now wants information on how a beginner ended up here alone. Did he happen to find a secret passage or something? But according to the protagonist, he has no idea. He simply appeared in this dungeon. The paladin says he has read about it in some book, but it only happens once every 100 years. Then the protagonist realizes that he's kind of unlucky, right? And after gathering all the information, the guy says he doesn't need to pay for the potions, as time in this labyrinth is money. Of course, the protagonist finds it strange that they are investing so much time in him, and it's certainly good to have survived. The guys then proceed in the direction the protagonist came from. You can tell by the trail of blood, right? Until the potion guy says the barbarian is lucky, but the blonde guy says that he went through all of that at the beginning of the game and is lucky. The woman says that the red-haired guy didn't want to use the potion, so it was the little blonde leader who saved the protagonist. And he doesn't deny it, but he says that the priestess thought the same. Just with that, the atmosphere got tense, and after a while of exchanging not-so-kind words, they began to question how far the barbarian's bloodstains go. The archer starts wondering if it was really luck for the barbarian, but then they continue on their way until they finally stop. Because what they've just found is the portal to the second floor of the labyrinth. This already cheered up their group, and when they were about to enter the portal, the woman tells them to wait a bit, and she points, asking if that there isn't the barbarian's sandal. The old man, completely excited, uses a light magic and casts it along the path they were coming from. You can see that the blood trail continues in that direction, guys. Everyone was in shock. The old man only asks the guide how far they've walked since they found the fallen barbarian, and the blonde guy says it was fucking 10 miles away. Only then did they understand that if the guy crawled alone for so long, he has the body of a monster. The redhead started trembling just thinking about it. If it were him in that place, could he endure all that? In fact, he remembers seeing that the barbarian was extending his right hand, and after that, he showed a magic gem. So, even while crawling for so long without knowing if he would survive, he never let go of his bargaining tool because he wanted to live. He had nothing else. The redhead immediately takes back what he said about the barbarian and even asks, what was that guy's name again? Everyone might think that barbarians are just dumb, crazy people who only think about killing. But that guy there is quite different. Back to the protagonist, you killed the goblin. He was tearing the creatures apart, using only the shield and his fist. He learned the goblin's patterns, spreading traps along the way. And even if they came from behind, the protagonist would turn around and defeat the goblins with the club. There was only one problem in all of this. He was hungry. The tribe leader had even given him a bag with food, but it was torn. In short, dragging himself around like that wasn't a good idea. As he lost five out of the seven loaves of bread he had, he starts thinking that he'll have to ration what's left. And the boy is kind of rough in size, right? He eats all the bread and says it's very tasty. But now he's thirsty. Where is he going to find water in this dungeon? This damn game didn't need to drink water before. But now that it's real life, the game is even harder, right? So, he gets up and pissed off, starts searching. After a while, he realizes that if the leader didn't give him water, there must be a way to get it. Then he hears, right in front of him, the sound of water. And there's a dude drinking water in the corner. He gets a bit closer, but the guy stands up and takes off. Then he stops to count his crystals, and he's in the 40s. For someone who was dying like crap out there, now he's doing a bit better, right? But a new problem has arisen, and it's fatigue, sleep, and currently, there are two ways to sleep in a dungeon. The first is just to sleep and leave fate in God's hands. The second is a bit more effective. Hey guys, let's be companions. Yes, the protagonist didn't expect everyone to refuse, which pisses him off again, although anything makes this guy angry, until suddenly someone calls him, and it's a guy all smiling named Hans, asking if he's really looking for a nighttime companion. But then he explains that it's to watch over each other while sleeping. I accept working with you. I am Bjorn, son of Jandel. So, the guy all romantically shakes his hand while saying it would be better if there were three, and all blushing, he asks if it's really just the two of them. The protagonist already wants to rip his head off, man, but he holds back since he needs this nighttime companion. After they play rock, paper, scissors, and Hans wins, he's the one who will sleep first. The protagonist, as always, gets pissed off, but this time it's because he's unlucky. Take this, it's called a watch. When the pointer is here, wake me up. Do you understand, or do you want me to explain it again? Want a drawing? You really think I'm dumb, huh? Yes, it's normal for people to have that impression of barbarians. And yes, the guy really slept like a rock. The protagonist is their 
thinking whether he should ask to borrow the guy's sleeping bag. He also hopes no goblins show up. With that, time passed, and finally, he woke up Hans. He thanks him for the good work and says it's now his turn to sleep for two hours. But obviously, the protagonist won't be able to. How can he trust this guy he's never seen before? So, the protagonist starts snoring because he's very tired. Is the guy going to betray him? He even turns his back to pretend to be clueless, giving an opening for the guy and just waits for the crazy guy to come at him. But the guy didn't do anything, and it was his turn to stand guard again. The protagonist didn't sleep at all. He starts to lose sanity, wondering why the guy didn't do anything. Then, he begins to regret not sleeping and says he needs to gain trust in the guy until he slowly starts to sleep. Man, he wakes up with a loud shout from the guy, and they just stare at each other. I didn't sleep a wink, you know? Then why don't you clean your mouth before talking? Ah, uh, sorry, man. The protagonist lets him know he can sleep more if he wants, and he'll continue to watch. But the guy, all happy, says there's no need. He can sleep, and he'll take care of it. The protagonist thanks him. Hans keeps that sly smile the whole time. The protagonist realizes it. The guy has a good image. He offers help, didn't blame him when he slept, and even refused to switch shifts when he made a mistake. In Dungeons and Stones, the game he knows, kind guys like this literally don't exist. He opens his eyes with the guy asking if he's awake, and with a giant hammer in hand, he asks if the protagonist doesn't want to sleep a little more. Man, if the protagonist hadn't dodged, he would have been smashed on the spot. He even jumped away, and the guy couldn't believe he dodged that. I think he triggered the rage of a guy who's already not quite right in the head. Someone might die in this mess. The protagonist goes at him with total hatred, and the guy asks him to wait. Then, he hits the guy with a shield, cracking his head. He kept asking to stop, that he could explain. But in the protagonist's mind, unlike the goblins, this guy didn't go down with just one hit, so just hit him again. The guy goes flying meters away, and starts crawling just like the protagonist did at the beginning of the story. But I tell you, this time the protagonist is kind of insane. The guy keeps apologizing, and the protagonist just wants to know why he did it. The guy said he was going to knock him out to steal the magic stones, then he starts talking about taking the shield too, and the equipment because it would fetch a good amount of money. Is that all? Yes, now let me go. I don't think that's going to happen, man. This is the last chance the protagonist is giving him to tell the truth, and the guy, scared out of his mind, says he wanted the heart. The barbarian is confused and doesn't quite understand, but the guy says that a barbarian's heart is worth a lot of money. It seems like they're being used as raw material for magical items. So, resuming, the protagonist was like a goblin to this guy. If he could hunt him, it would be worth it. But Bjorn wants to know why he only acted now and not when he was sleeping. And the reason is that he also needed to sleep. Now that I've said everything, are you going to let me go? The protagonist knows that more people like this guy will appear. So will he always let them go? The guy starts saying he's not like the others. But the protagonist just raises the shield. And this is the first one to die at his hands. It's only been one day since he entered this new world. And he has already killed someone. Achievement unlocked for committing your first murder plus one permanent mindset. And with that, the character equipped shoulder pads. And the item level increased by plus 13. Then, he equipped a backpack, expanding the inventory space, and equipped the hammer, increasing the item level by plus 30. He also put on boots. In summary, he equipped everything that belonged to our buddy Hans. I told you that guy was a true buddy. He gave our barbarian a bunch of cool items. Let's thank him, right? Thank you, Hans. You're a real friend. Thanks to him, the protagonist stepped out of primitive life. Now, he has water, medicine, and even a watch to tell the time. And here is the current status of our barbarian. Now, he simply goes goes around destroying the goblins. This big hammer here was very useful. Around day 2, the goblins started appearing in groups. Nothing he couldn't handle. But there was a single problem here, and it wasn't the goblins. He killed them all very easily. The problem again was sleep. He would even lean against the wall to relax a bit. But at that moment, goblins always showed up, thinking he was asleep. This already made him furious, saying he didn't rest for even 10 minutes. And then he crushed them all. After cleaning up, he says he's going to take a nap. But out of nowhere, a system message appears saying he was attacked by a goblin while sleeping. There was literally a chubby one stabbing his chest, man. He gets startled and slaps the chubby one away. The other goblin, seeing his friend zooming past him at about 80 kilometers per hour and noticing that the protagonist was kind of mad about the stabbing, ran away. Only a fool would stay. Now, dealing with the stab wound is the problem. The protagonist thought he would wake up before being stabbed, but now he has to take care of the wound, and the barbarian says the potion hurts more than the stab. That doesn't even make sense. 14 hours after killing Hans, he thinks about finding another nighttime companion like Hans used to say. Now that he knows the value of his heart, and unlike the other day, everyone wants him on their team. Maybe because he's cleaner now,
now. I don't know, but everyone who passed by invited him. However, today he's the one refusing, saying he would only join his own race, the barbarians. He no longer considers himself human. After a while of walking through the dungeon, he spots an elf sitting in a corner. She looks at him and gets scared, of course. According to the system, the protagonist has found an injured elf. The first thing he does is ask if she's hurt, which makes her even more alert. After taking a closer look, he realizes she has an arrow in her abdomen, and it wasn't done by goblins. Automatically, he asks if she was injured by humans while approaching. The girl just kneels and starts begging for forgiveness. The barbarian becomes completely confused by this, and she asks that just this once, just this once, he spares her. She has to take care of her little brother at home. Now, the protagonist starts getting totally confused because it's not normal for elves to be like this. Normally, they were cold in the game. All of this leads him to try to resolve this misunderstanding with a little smile. Don't worry, my dear elf, I have no intention of killing you. The elf was shocked. She keeps saying she knows he's a barbarian, but does he really have to do this? Could he just let her go this time? Now, the protagonist starts getting angry and questions why she's so scared. Then, he just tosses her some items to heal and says they'll talk later. And these items are the healing leaves, the ones the barbarian took from the old companion. Why are you giving me this? Do you need a reason for me to help you? I will protect you, so take care of your wounds. And of course, he has a reason to help her, as he needs a nighttime companion. And I have to say something, this wound here is big, right? Man, I think I've never seen a wound this big. But her situation is not good at all. Besides not having slept and being very wounded, she has a good appearance. It's much worse for her to find a nighttime companion than for him. I am the barbarian, son of someone, and I am Irvin. Now, the protagonist wants to know why she's so afraid of him, and she says it's because she's an elf and he's a barbarian. But what does that have to do with anything? She says they are mortal enemies, and this is different from the game since it didn't say anything about that. Quickly, she regrets it, saying that, in fact, this war ended 10 years ago, and she has nothing against barbarians. In short, she just doesn't want to fight with him. He understands that he actually doesn't know everything about this world, and hearing that he doesn't want trouble either, she becomes very happy. But what he actually wants from her is for her to be his nighttime companion. He is very tired, and she must be too, so why don't they cooperate? She thinks about it, and remembers that barbarians value their honor above all. So, she asks him to swear on his warrior's honor that he won't do anything to her. And as always, this starts to make him angry. But she says she will swear too, so he accepts. But he has to make something clear first. He's not a lord, he's just Bjorn. Of course, she has no idea that this giant barbarian named Bjorn is only 20 years old. I Bjorn, son of my father, whose name I already forgot, I swear on my warrior's honor, Erwin Fornaxi of Tertia, I swear by the name of my clan. And so, the oath of non-aggression towards each other for at least this night is finally made. He says he will sleep first, that she might feel safer that way. She says it's not exactly like that anymore, but it's okay. This time, he's the one who gives her the watch, just asking her to be careful because it's expensive. He lies down, thinking he'll pretend to snore and sleep for about 10 minutes just to make sure. But suddenly, he wakes up all startled, drooling. As always, he asks how much time has passed since he slept, and she says two hours. He claims it was because of the sleeping bag and the blanket that their friend Hans left. Now, he feels obliged to lend it to her as well, and she's very happy about it, eventually falling asleep. And heavy, she must have been as tired as our barbarian. For him, it feels like weeks have passed in this game, but it's only been three days since he arrived. This makes him wonder, what happened to his body in the real world? Well, from what we remember, it was sucked into the monitor, but the protagonist has no idea. When he checks the watch, there were only 10 minutes left to wake up the sleeping beauty, and only then does he start to worry. What should he do with her? Join her and share all the loot obtained? From the third day, the game starts sending groups of goblins instead of single goblins. He says that he can easily handle up to four goblins, but the question here is, safety to sleep or more magic stones? The problem continues to be sleep. Then, out of nowhere, he spots two humans coming in his direction. They are already whispering if that isn't the elf they were looking for, and the other says yes, it is her. The blonde comes up to him and asks about his relationship with the elf. He's a bit grumpy but still friendly, saying they are nighttime companions. However, when the blonde asks when he goes away and leave her alone, he gets completely furious and says he won't even answer. This makes the guys tremble, but he says he understands and tells them to leave. Did he understand that he was going to be sliced? The barbarian understands that she is being sought, and now it's time to wake her up. But she's all sly, asks him to wait five more minutes while pulling the blanket. You know who got nervous, he calls her again, and she just complains. This makes him understand that she was pretending to be asleep. Earlier, the blanket was loose, and now she
she's holding it. Suddenly, she feels a pull. The protagonist just pulled her and sat her down like a child. This guy is truly a barbarian. He wants to know right away why she was pretending to be asleep. And she, all sad, says that if she got up, he would abandon her and leave. In the protagonist's mind, this is strange. It's strange that she's worried about this. So, he thinks that when she opens her eyes, their deal will be over. However, before that, he asks what she has to do with those two. And she asserts that absolutely nothing. It doesn't make sense for them to recognize her like that. And she assumes they are from the same clan as the man who tried to hurt her. At least the symbol on their clothes was from the clan called Crystal Union. Right away, he understands that it's dangerous to get involved with her since an entire clan is pursuing her. But looking at her, and knowing that she is only 20 years old, just like him, he tells her to follow him so they can talk while they walk. Go for it, protagonist. I want the beautiful elf on the team. She asks if he will help her, but he says he wants to hear the whole story first, which excites the elf. Now he listens to her story. She encountered the man on the first day inside the labyrinth, and they became nighttime companions. However, she felt something strange and ended up opening her eyes. What she saw was the man coming at her with his hand in a strange place, telling her she should sleep a little more. She only found out later that this guy is the manager of a clan that does business on the first floor. Well, for me, I already need to start making my list of people the protagonist has to kill in this story. And for now, I have only two people. At the top of the list is this scumbag who attacked the elf. In second place is that miserable cleric who didn't heal the protagonist. For now, let's leave our list like this. Back to the elf. She says she managed to escape that day, but his clan keeps pursuing her. That's how she ended up with an arrow in her abdomen. Now the protagonist wants to know how they can track her, and it seems they use message stones to continue chasing her. Message stones are a mystical device that allows communication when synchronized before use, with a range of about 300 meters. It's like a walkie-talkie, and he realizes that if he leaves her alone, she will be captured. But it doesn't seem like she did anything wrong, so why so much insistence from them? Is it just to shut her up? She says it's not like that, and all blushing, she says that when she was running away for the first time, she threw her knife, and it happened that. It seems she hit in a terrible place. In a terrible place, if you mean. There, you know? I heard it got really ugly. He couldn't even put it back with potions. Yeah, that's more than enough reason for them to pursue you. She apologizes shyly for that, but it was simply karma for the guy, right? Suddenly, she feels a strange sensation and tells Bjorn not to look back. They are being followed. There's a group behind them at a distance of 150 meters. The protagonist is impressed with her precision, and this must be the passive ability of the elves. The protagonist says they will pick up the pace and asks if everything is okay for her. She says yes, but he knows that her wound has reopened. However, she didn't complain. This strong little elf, I didn't like it. I loved it. But even though they are accelerating, the distance between them has not decreased. So the protagonist starts thinking of a plan. She notices that he is very pensive, asking if everything is okay. But he only asks what she is good at. Proudly, she says she is good at washing clothes and cleaning the house, which cools down the barbarian strategy atmosphere. I'm talking about combat, crazy girl. She says she's good with bows, with spiritual fire magic. And the protagonist realizes that this is the rarest element. But he wants to know if she has ever killed someone before. She says no but claims that if needed she can. The protagonist says he understands and asks if she wouldn't like to become his companion until they leave the labyrinth. But then I'll get the rewards. And me? Me? What about me? I get nothing? Okay, then I'll take nine. And you take one. I won't accept complaints. Surprisingly, she agrees to the deal, now being only 100 meters away from the enemy. The protagonist decides to change the plan. They will take a detour and asks Erwin to summon the fire spirit, which she does, of course. The protagonist didn't expect to return to this place. The elf warns that the enemies are closer, and Bjorn asks her to cancel her summoning. Suddenly, they become visible. The protagonist knew that these guys have good tracking techniques to enter the darkness. So, he calls our favorite elf and tells her to shoot to take down the enemies. She pulls her bow in this beautiful archer pose and with a cold look, shoots her arrow towards the opponent, hitting him right on the head. She thinks she just got her first kill, and the protagonist praises her, saying that if she had hesitated, they could be in danger now. Now, approaching the body. Serdin, can you hear me? Serdin, Serdin, respond. Damn, we lost contact with Serdin. He was chasing that girl and the barbarian. Everyone listening to this transmission now, gather in the goblin district. The guy who came after Bjorn and the elf was named Serdin. After checking Serdin's items, the protagonist saw that he had two daggers, a bag full of magic crystals, and a potion on his belt. As for the clothes Serin was wearing, now it's the elf who's wearing them. The protagonist says she looks much better now. She teaches him how to use the communication item in the shape of a stone, pressing the button on its side.
Repeat, repeat. Serdin is no longer responding. He was chasing that elf and was defeated. They are in the goblin district. She is with a barbarian who has a big hammer. And the reward is 10,000 gold coins. The elf girl was already in shock. But he tells her not to worry and to summon her spirit because they are going to travel through the darkness now. They head directly to the second floor of this dungeon. After some time, she calls him, sir, and asks if they are really going to the second floor. He says yes. And she questions if he is aware that it is much more difficult difficult than the first floor. He assures her that he is aware and that there won't be any problems since they are a good combination, which makes her a bit embarrassed. The truth is, a tank and a range damage dealer have always been a good combination. However, she was still hesitant to go until the radio starts playing again, with the voice saying that if they catch the elf, they will allow him to keep her instead of the 10,000 gold. Hearing this, she quickly agrees and says she will go to the second floor with the big guy. Of course, the protagonist didn't want her to hear that, but he spared himself from convincing her to go. According to him, he always liked helping the needy, especially if he could mess with scum on the way. There would be no greater joy than helping while completely destroying the trash. In other words, there's no reason not to help. As they walked, she asked if he knew the way, and he said not exactly, but if they go north, they'll get there. Of course, he knows this because he played the game a lot, right? Then suddenly, she warns him to wait because there's a goblin trap ahead, and she will take care of it. Obviously, the goblins took the opportunity to attack from behind. She dodges the first one and shoots with her bow, hitting one of the goblins right in the head. The other came charging, but she was already behind him at full speed and he went down too. This woman is impressive, folks. All cheerful, she asks how she did for the big guy and he praises her very well, saying she is even better than he expected. Then she gives him the magic crystals, saying that as promised, he gets nine and she gets one, right? All cheerful, she happily mentions that if they keep progressing like this, she'll also be able to earn some and give a present to her young younger brother. The protagonist, somewhat puzzled, agrees and tells her to work hard. Suddenly, the radio starts speaking again, announcing that they've increased the reward to 20,000 gold coins, dead or alive. However, as always, the protagonist reassures her, saying they won't be pursued in the darkness. Yet, another issue arises. Ghouls this time, not exactly that, but more like undead. She asks if she should fight them, but he says they'll fight together this time. In Dungeon and Stone, you get more rewards the first time you defeat a monster of the same species. In other words, the more species of monsters you kill, the more you level up. This is a real opportunity for them. The protagonist goes ahead and smashes them, and those coming from behind are easily taken down by arrows. With a trustworthy companion on the team, this becomes child's play, and they defeat the ghouls, continuing north until they eventually reach the third day. On the way, they spot something, find blood, and according to her, it's not from goblins. Whose blood could it be, folks? Who almost lost a foot here and even left a sandal behind? Here is where our barbarian barbarian appeared in the first place he stepped into the labyrinth, and just behind that place was the portal to the second floor. Remembering that he almost died because of it, he gets angry, slamming his hammer on the ground and cursing a lot. Owen gets scared and starts apologizing, thinking it's because of something she did. He's upset, as usual, due to the bad luck he has. If he had just appeared and gone to the other side, he would already be on the second floor. Meanwhile, the elf girl is crying, thinking it's her fault. He tells her not to worry, as it's not her fault, and only then does she understand the situation, expressing sympathy for what he must have been through. The surprise for him is that she really understood what happened here. However, she says she's sure they went to heaven, his friends, meaning she didn't understand anything. But okay, life goes on. So finally, the time has come to enter the portal to the second floor. You have arrived at the second floor, the goblin forest. They fall from the sky and crash onto the ground. And now they are in the northern area of the goblin forest. It seems there's no living being within a 50 meter radius. And it's well it thanks to the stars. Erwin questions why she has never heard of a forest on the second floor, and the protagonist explains that there are four portals on the first floor. One leads to the goblin forest in the north, another to the beast's lair in the east, another to the land of the dead in the west, and finally, the southern portal leads to the dark rocky mountain. Of all the places, this one they landed in was the least bad. The protagonist asks if she knows how to get back to the city afterward, how to exit the dungeon. She says that after a certain amount of time, everyone will be automatically pulled out of the dungeon directly to the city. To be precise, on the first floor, it's after 168 hours, and on the second floor, it's 240 hours. After that time, they will be pulled to the city. The protagonist decides that when it's close to the 168 hours on the first floor, they will go back there and teleport, so that the clan chasing her won't see them anymore. For now, let's explore the region near the portal. The elf girl goes ahead, leading the way and pointing out traps. The protagonist says he doesn't see 
see anything there except leaves and stones. But then she throws a stone, and there it is. The elf asks if it was good, and the barbarian just says she did her job. After a while of scouting, they realize that even with many traps, there are no goblins nearby. They continue their exploration. The issue with the second floor is that goblins here tend to move in groups of 12, and there are also mutant goblins that are warriors and archers. So, the protagonist plans to clear the traps and expand the exploration area, always staying close to the portal, since they can run into it if something happens. Slowly, they keep doing this until she senses a presence again, this time a group of goblins. It seems there are more than 10, and they are at least 50 meters away. The protagonist asks how close they can get without being seen, and she, without the big hammer, can get up to about 30 meters alone. And it makes sense, right? Imagine Bjorn trying to hide in the middle of the bushes, you know? The man looks like a truck, whereas the elf girl can walk quietly without making noise. Finally, she spots the group of goblins and signals to the protagonist that she has seen them. After loading an arrow, she shoots with all her might. This time, the protagonist couldn't even see if she hit or not. So, he rushes past her, telling her to stay behind him. He gets right in front of the green ones and starts to think that he's not getting intimidated even with this number of enemies. On the contrary, folks, he feels like his body wants to act on its own. The warrior's heart he possesses is going crazy for the battle. Then he delivers a big hammer hit to a goblin, and the creature almost took off like it was heading to Mars, reaching Elon Musk before the protagonist knew it. All I know is that the protagonist is going crazy, shielding, hammering, but suddenly he feels the danger. A goblin almost sliced his face. If he had taken just one more second, he would be without a head. Of course, the goblins don't give Bjorn time to breathe. If he were alone, he would certainly come out at least injured from here, but that's if he were alone. Our favorite elf is only in long distance support, thanks to which the protagonist is free to play on the battlefield. You defeated Goblin Warrior plus one experience. Our protagonist earned 11 magic crystals after defeating the first group of goblins. Considering that it took him the whole day on the first floor to earn 44 of them, this was really good. The protagonist ends up giving her two crystals instead of one since he will keep the Goblin Warrior's crystal, which is worth more. They continued exploring, and as they started exploring in a radius larger than 3 kilometers, groups of goblins began to appear every five minutes, including now having archers with stealth abilities. Now things are going to get crazy, folks. The goblins started coming at them with everything, and of course, they were all hammered. The protagonist was hitting everyone, but he was already in the sights of the goblin archer. Did the protagonist let his guard down? The arrow was almost hitting him, but he dodged it at the last moment. Of course, he was attentive to it, and now he even knows the location of the archer. You defeated a goblin archer plus one experience. After approximately 15 hours of wandering around, they decide to take a break. The protagonist says she can sleep first this time. Of course, she already asked to borrow the sleeping bag and blanket. So, after putting away their weapons, she falls asleep, probably feeling safer with the protagonist now. For having hunted for more than 15 hours, they have earned many rewards so far. They also encountered other groups as they expanded the exploration area. Groups always with more than three people, and some even with species from another world. Of course, they just pass by each other, but the protagonist doesn't really like seeing other people. The explorers are scarier than the dungeon monsters themselves, especially now that he has a reason to be concerned. Now, on the fourth day inside the dungeon, they were battling again, resting on the fifth day, and on the sixth day, they encountered other people. Finally, the seventh day arrived, the day to leave this labyrinth, as there were two hours and four 47 minutes left until the first floor closed. The protagonist's order is to start heading back to the portal so they won't be late. The elf warns that there are new traps on the way, probably because the goblins are respawning. She also mentions another goblin group 70 meters away. The protagonist immediately decides they will fight again, and there were 8 normal goblins, 2 archers, and 2 warriors, totaling 12 goblins. The protagonist is like a bulldozer running over the goblins. He kills the goblin warriors while telling Erwin to go after the archers. It seems he's hitting harder than before, according to him, due to the countless battles they've had so far. This also applies to Erwin. Now she knows when and where to shoot, as if she's accustomed to the scenario. She had mentioned two archers, but no arrows came her way so far. Of course, he compliments her, but he also wants to know if she took care of the two archers or not, so he doesn't have to worry about the arrows. She doesn't say anything because she wasn't sure if she killed the second one, and this is good because doubtful information can be even more dangerous. This leads him to feel 
proud of her. Suddenly, she notices something different about that goblin archer, and what they are seeing is nothing less than a goblin archer essence. The protagonist knows that this is extremely rare, as he researched about it before. He saw in forums that essences are part of the skill system in this game. Essences provide both a passive and an active skill with variable attributes. However, there is a limit to how many you can absorb, so you have to choose the right ones for a good future in the game. The drop rate for this is close to 0%. This already upsets the protagonist because he would never be so lucky to drop something like this for him. The elf asks if a person turns into a goblin after absorbing the essence, but he says no, they just gain some of the goblin's abilities. He gives the example of the guy who followed them on the first floor. He had consumed the essence of a wolf monster and could track them by scent. The protagonist lets the elf keep the essence because he already knows which essence he wants. So, he can't just pick any, as it will cause trouble later. The protagonist says it's okay, but she has to promise something to him to keep it. This was something he was going to say on the first floor. Before he finishes speaking, a group of people arrives telling them not to move. The guy immediately starts talking nonsense, asking what they are doing. The elf was already starting to explain that they were hunting, but our 5 meter tall Bjorn warns her that she doesn't need to answer them. He grabs her by the shoulders and literally throws her into the essence, causing her to merge with it. The guy who was watching this started to get desperate and angry at the same time, shouting that the essence was theirs. After the elf returns to him, he challenges them to come forward if they want to fight, asking if they can hear him. He's ready to smash them with his hammer. After that, they they ran full speed toward the portal, and of course, they are not running away from the guys. The protagonist literally made the guys run. The problem is that, according to the protagonist's analysis, they also intend to go through the portal and return to the city just like them. So, they will end up bumping into each other again, and it's better to avoid that, right? The elf warns that there is a group of goblins 50 meters away, where the Bjorn says to avoid them this time. Still, it seems it won't work since they have already detected them. He decides in last minute that they should go in the opposite opposite direction, and she confirms this while an arrow was coming straight towards her face. Luckily, at the last second, Bjorn pulled her back with all his might, and it seems that this arrow is not from a goblin archer. Probably it's the guys from before, says Bjorn. According to the protagonist, the guys called the goblins, and they must be waiting on the other side. So, he tells her to use her powers because they will have to fight. She is a bit confused, but he says that all these essences have their special abilities, and the one she absorbed earlier was the essence of a goblin archer. This literally boosts all her status statistics and adds a passive and active ability. The passive one is the poison arrow when using bows, which literally causes poison damage. The active ability is the thief's steps that put the user in stealth mode. And of course, this impresses the protagonist. She can activate it and even do so without even needing to say anything, just with her will. He only gives her the bag to carry because he will deal with the goblins alone while she takes care of the human archer behind them. Of course, she doesn't accept it much, but he says they don't have time and tells her to hide until he signals her to shoot the human archer. The protagonist starts running towards the goblins and begins to beat them, fighting several at the same time, defending and attacking at an insane speed, until finally, the archer started attacking again, and these seconds of carelessness were enough for a goblin to hit the protagonist from behind. He immediately turns and smashes this goblin with a blow, and now it's complicated for him to deal with the ones in front and still without support from the elf. With that, the injuries accumulated, and the fatigue also came, until he felt that two arrows were coming at the same time towards him. One is from the goblin archer, and the other is from the guy with the crossbow. He realized that it would be impossible to block both, so at the last moment, he decided to block the crossbow arrow in a very stylish way, I would say. This led him to be hit by the goblin's arrow right in the elbow. At that moment, he felt it was poisoned, and started to lose movement in his arm. So, he kind of had to choose between the shield or the hammer, and removing the arrow, he decided to stick with the shield for sure, as with the shield, he can still defend and attack while protecting himself from those humans. As always, he gets completely furious along the way, and the goblins even start running away from him in fear. He knows he doesn't need to go after them now, especially since he has another matter to deal with. The guys are already saying they're impressed that he dealt with the goblins alone, and of course, the protagonists always knew it was them. When the guys insult the elf, he goes crazy, challenging them to come at him, impressing them as he still has energy even after facing all the goblins alone. But even so, he tries to blackmail, saying that since the barbarian is injured, he'll let him go if he tells him where the elf is. This makes our Bjorn smile, and this makes the guys call him sick for laughing in such a situation. Then their leader orders them not to lower their guard and to think they're hunting a giant monster. However, now he has a useless arm, so it's time for him to give the signal.
signal. And the signal is something even people from this world will understand. He immediately goes after the leader of the guys out of nowhere, delivering a violent thrust with the shield against the guy's sword, which quickly made the guy call his buddy. The old samurai came slicing with great force, making the shield move aside, but the protagonist goes all out again. The problem is that now he's surrounded, and just as he was about to start wondering if Erwin lost to the crossbow guy, an arrow started coming with force, but no one there knew whose it was. All they knew was that it was coming straight at him with the leader, and since the tank of the guys defended it, this arrow must be from the elf. The tank quickly starts yelling for them to attack the barbarian, as he will take care of the arrows, and the guy was indeed defending, while the other two were attacking the protagonist from both sides. The leader hit the shield from the front, while the samurai came from the back. Quickly, the protagonist made the decision to offer his useless arm in exchange for landing a beautiful blow to the head of the leader of the guys. And what a blow it was, my friends. Even the toothless one there started complaining that he's a monster. Bjorn quickly looks back and manages to dodge the samurai's next attack. He creates some distance until something surprises the old samurai, an arrow that the tank ended up defending. However, this time, it's a fire arrow since it has the spirit of fire, which forces the tank to throw away the shield. And in the next scene, he already took an arrow to the shoulder. Now, the shield has a dent, and there's another injured by the arrow. The leader understands that if he stays there, the situation will get ugly for him, so he runs away, saying he will take care of the elf. The samurai starts attacking harder, telling the protagonist to give up. Our Bjorn gains some momentum and, using the shield to block the view, when he's very close, he lays the shield down to extend the reach and hit the samurai, but the rascal managed to dodge. However, he ended up hitting the tank behind him. The guy went flying, spitting blood. The old man gets angry and comes back slicing again, but the protagonist is calm. He just doesn't understand why this strong samurai is in a group like this, so they start exchanging blows again, but this time it's a fair 1v1, folks. The protagonist throws the shield at the old man's head, grabs him by the collar, pulls him close, and he gives the old man a little bite on the neck, completely lost in anger. That's how Bjorn stood tall, and the other two had already gone to heaven. This was a true barbarity, we have to admit. Suddenly, we see Erwin running towards the protagonist, calling him sir. She asks if he's okay and quickly tells him to take a potion, all concerned for the protagonist. After taking the potion, the protagonist says his insides are bubbling. He feels every vein in his body, and his skin is burning and itching. After a while, we see her encouraging him, saying he can do it, but he just wants to know what time it is now. She says it's 11.20, 10 minutes since he took the potion, which reminds him that there are 40 minutes left until the first floor closes. So, he quickly orders her to take off her clothes, making her completely shy. She was already undressing, thinking he must have some reason for it, but the protagonist says he wasn't telling her to undress herself but to remove the clothes from the bodies of the guys who died. After that, the protagonist tells her to forget about the clothes and just grab the items they are after. She quickly grabs the crossbow from the guy. At that moment, there were 26 minutes left for the portal to close. They ran as fast as they could, and with only 8 minutes remaining, they finally saw the portal. With just 50 seconds left, they entered it as fast as they could. Of course, the protagonist ended up falling headfirst on the other side, while she landed gracefully. While he was annoyed for falling headfirst, she was excited, saying that it was all very fun, and she thanks him for the good job. He reciprocates, and she mentions that now he can talk about the condition of the essence he mentioned earlier. Still, there's not much time to discuss it now, so they'll talk about it when they get out. With only 8 seconds left, he was trying to remember the name of the tavern, and with 4 seconds left, his head was almost exploding from thinking. In the last second, he says it's the black whale. He'll meet her there on the other side. And so, the labyrinth was closed, folks. The character was sent to Raftonia, the starting city. Finally, the protagonist is back, and it can be seen that others returned as well. He just didn't expect there to be so many. No matter how much time passes in the labyrinth, when you leave, it will always be noon of the next day, and you have to adjust the clock. Suddenly, a gigantic guy starts calling for him. The protagonist remembers that this guy is Vanon's son, Carrick, and they greet each other. After that, Serum, Senex's son, arrives, and it was only a matter of time before many barbarians appeared. This makes the protagonist have a reaction similar to mine. Where did so many barbarians come from? Suddenly, the guys start going to the store to count the crystals, betting on who has more. Of course, they invite Bjorn to join the bet. The woman doing the counting said there were 41,498 crystals there, which impresses everyone. Then it's the protagonist's turn. The woman quickly starts counting, which impresses Bjorn, and when she reveals the result, it's an astonishing 182,413 crystals. Folks, making it 9 to 1 with the elf was easy. This causes all the barbarians to start praising him since
since he broke the record for the store's crystals, especially after seeing that. In addition to the crystals, he had shoes, a bag, and even a weapon. Quickly, everyone starts shouting his name, making him happy, even yelling that he is the best warrior of all. Then they started tossing him in the air while shouting his name, Bjorn, Bjorn, Bjorn. With that, time passed, and the protagonist began to mingle with the other barbarians, until he sees someone familiar from afar, our favorite elf. She's there all happy, talking with a group of elves, which makes the protagonist jealous as he is surrounded by muscular guys. When she looks at him, she gives a little wave. He tries to say quietly to meet at night, and she confirms it. But out of nowhere, the other elf who was with her asks if Erwin knows that barbarian, and she quickly says no. On the muscular side, the barbarian also claimed not to know her. The guy got angry, saying that there's no way the greatest warrior of all time would be on good terms with those cowardly pointy-eared ones. This upset the other elf. The protagonist understood that this wasn't going well. A war between the muscular and the beautiful pointy-eared ones was about to start right in front of him. After a while, when the dust settled and he was walking through the city, he started seeing families reuniting everywhere, whether brothers or sons, but there were also those who didn't return. And similarly, it was happening everywhere. It's different to see this in person than in the 2D game, but now it's time to celebrate. The muscular ones were downing mugs and mugs of beer. Even the women were doing it. Some guys were even downing two mugs at once, which made the protagonist rethink why he was with them. He just wanted to see if there was something he needed to learn from the barbarians, but they were just downing one mug after another without thinking about anything. So he stands up, angry, saying that he has to leave. Immediately, all the barbarians in the bar turn to him, asking why the protagonist is leaving. But in the end, they just wish good luck to the best barbarian warrior. Now, walking for a while, he realizes that this world is very peaceful. There were even different races walking together. So after buying some new clothes, he goes to an inn and takes a bath, thinking that if it's peaceful like this, living in this city might not be so bad. Now, coming out of the bath, our gigantic barbarian throws himself on the bed in just his underwear. And the guy is gigantic, his feet sticking out of the bed. Now we have to admit that the guy is quite a hump. I want to see the elf resist. Now, with his head on the pillow, he misses his old home. But he better get up because there are things to do. And when he woke up, it was 9.18 p.m. He left the dungeon at noon, so he figured he must have slept for about 4 or 5 hours. The next day, he asked about the tavern, and the guy said it disappeared. It seems the son got into a betting scheme 10 years ago, and then they changed owners and the name of the place. The protagonist wants to know the new name, and the guy says it's Python Puth, where the protagonist is now, and it seems different from when she played. Already inside the bar, things seem lively until he spots Erwin calling for him with the other grumpy elf. The woman already says that he is that barbarian, but he politely says his name is Bjorn. And who are you, elf? She says she is Erwin's older sister. You can call me Terja. And out of nowhere, she stands up saying that she has a question to ask him. Why did he ask to see a little girl so late in a tavern like this? Also, he called her last night and didn't show up. This makes her call him shameless. He's completely confused, asking how so, about last night? Are you going to play dumb now, you cheater? He quickly asks Erwin how long it's been since they left the dungeon, and she says about 30 hours. And only then does the protagonist understand that he didn't sleep for 4 or 5 hours as he thought, but rather slept for 30 hours straight. The guy is no longer the protagonist. He's a sleeping bag. He laid down and went into a coma. In his mind, it makes sense to feel so light after sleeping for an entire day. But Erwin is calm and cute, just observing the situation. Of course, he apologizes for his mistake and informs them that he slept until now, which leaves Terja completely stunned since she has never seen a barbarian apologizing before. Then she says that she didn't expect much from him, but wants to know what he wants with Erwin in this place. And he simply says that he's not obliged to tell her anything. She gets completely furious with him, and they start arguing like crazy in front of everyone until suddenly she puts a bag with 350,000 crystals on the table, saying that's the amount Erwin earned from the essences. Then she stands there, looking, asking why he's not taking the money. She even speculates that he has another motive, as she had thought. The protagonist just asks if our little elf agrees with her sister. The deal he was going to propose was for her to help him until he reached the amount he wanted, which surprises her, asking if that's all he wanted. He even says he would split it 50-50 with her this time, which makes her completely happy but suddenly loses the excitement and immediately apologizes because from now on, she has to form a group with her sister. Then the sister starts saying that she would never let her go alone. It was only the first time because it was part of the ritual and everything, always the same excuse. Of course, this leaves the protagonist infuriated as usual, but she just pushes the bag and tells him to take the crystals if he understands. But the protagonist says that these 350,000 crystals 
bills are probably a half share according to the current price, right? And she says yes. But the protagonist says that if that's the case, 280,000 crystals are missing since the promised split was 90 to 10. She chuckles and says she almost forgot and literally grabs 280,000 crystals and puts them on the table. She really tried to deceive him. Now he understands why barbarians and elves hate each other. So he says that if she's done, she could leave. He needs to talk to Erwin. This leaves the sister somewhat confused. But suddenly, our elf pulls her sister by the arm, thanking her for coming and asking if she could leave since she needs to thank and say goodbye to the barbarian. The sister is impressed. It seems Erwin is growing up. Then she points to our warrior and tells him to swear. And it's to swear that he won't sleep with Erwin. If he swears, she will leave. Our elf, hearing this, blushes completely. While the protagonist wonders if he can't just sleep with her, are the other options allowed? She keeps pointing her finger and telling him to swear. And he says he swears. I swear on my honor as a warrior. And so she was leaving the scene when she remembered something. Remembered to thank him for saving Erwin and even called him by name. Our little elf fell with shyness, but the protagonist remained bold. When she gets up, she asks if she was too rude to her own sister. He tells her not to worry. Everything will be fine. Then she thanks him for his earlier offer, but she had already decided to work with her sister a long time ago and apologizes. He just says it's okay. Then she quickly pulls out a bag with 63,000 crystals, saying it's from the crossbow guy and the toothless leader. She has already taken her share from here. She also mentions that she left the two backpacks at her house, and he should go there tomorrow to see for himself what's inside. He realizes that she knows everything he wants without even having to say anything. It will be sad to lose such a helpful companion. Suddenly, she asks how she should repay him. She literally wants to repay him for saving her in the dungeon, and now her sister's concern makes sense. The protagonist thinks for a bit, but can't think of anything at the moment. So he ends up asking if she wants to eat something. She says she's not hungry, so he says he'll order just for himself. Suddenly, she blushes and has the brilliant idea that she wants to have something to drink. She wants her first post-dungeon drink, and it's with the barbarian. He understands that in the game, there was something like that, and it had significant meaning for the elves. So, he says he's happy? She scolds him, saying he should say thank you, and that's what he does. He thanks her, and she happily says you're welcome. Then she says that, of course, this wouldn't be his first post-dungeon drink, but he interrupts, asking what she's talking about. This is indeed his first time too. I told you like 30 times that I was 20 years old. What? You weren't kidding? Not only that, but that was also his first time going to the dungeon. Finally, the food arrives. She says he did very well in the dungeon, and he returns the compliment. They make their first toast, and after a while, they were talking about some nonsensical things, like him wearing a shirt today, and she's wearing a skirt. He keeps turning one mug after another, which impresses her. Then he says he thought of a way for her to repay him as she wanted. All pompous, she asks what that way is, but he says it has to be somewhere else because otherwise, the security guards will come after them. She blushes and with a mischievous look asks if it can be in his room. He is completely breathless and sweating, and she is also breathless and crying, saying she can't take it anymore. I knew the barbarian was too much for her, but in reality, the protagonist was giving her a chiropractic session. As he doesn't control his strength well, he almost pulled her arm back, so she was crying, saying she couldn't take it anymore. After they finish, she thinks he was going to rip her arm off, but in reality, he was just testing her plus four flexibility status. She gets angry, asking if he called her here just to test her abilities, and he confirms that he did. He just wanted to test since the use of abilities is prohibited in the city, which disappoints her. Then he starts making a bunch of theories about the game's statistics, and had been lost in thought for some time when she pulls him, saying she's sleepy. And what I least expected happened. Unlike anime cliches, they literally slept together. Well, that took his honor as a barbarian and threw it away. The next day, the barbarian shows Erwin the loot he brought from the dungeon, and she asks if he's going to sell all of it because she wants to keep the leather armor and the belt. He says she can have the pieces since it will be deducted from her share. They visit various shops in the city to sell the items, and Bjorn manages to get a total of 1,400,000 crystals, while Erwin is surprised by how little she earned, only 50,000 crystals. According to Bjorn, it's the first time he's made so much money right at the beginning of the game. He says it's time to part ways with Erwin, and she's upset, asking them to at least go to the central square together. Arriving at the square, there's a crowd gathered, and Erwin asks what's happening. Looking at a soldier, Bjorn replies that it's an execution. A man is gagged and about to be guillotined. Bjorn explains that these people didn't commit any serious crimes, 
They just didn't pay taxes. The barbarian continues, saying the city has been cursed by a witch, and the only way to get resources in its limited space is through the labyrinth. Those who don't pay taxes will be executed because it would reduce the mouths to feed. People start running toward the guillotine, holding bread, which they dip into the executed man's blood and start eating. Owen is disgusted by the scene, and the barbarian explains that, according to legend, drinking the blood of an executed person will bring money. The barbarian asks Owen how much the tax is for the first year, and it's almost the same as in the game, so he asks about the second year onwards. According to her, the tax increases in the second year, and there are also fees on trades. According to Bjorn, the fees increase with each year of work, which is why he has to get stronger during that time. He thinks that if he can't return to his world and doesn't get stronger, he might end up at the guillotine too. If he doesn't want to go through that, he needs to reach at least the sixth floor of the labyrinth. The barbarian goes to a library and thinks that, in the game, it was still being built. People stare as he passes, and looking at a table ahead is Einar sleeping with her face in a book. Bjorn tries to wake the girl, who's even drooling. She looks sleepily at the barbarian. But as soon as she wakes up, she starts shouting greetings to the barbarian, bothering the people around. He asks her to speak more quietly about what she's doing in a library. Einar says she's following his advice to think before acting, so she sought more knowledge, which already sets her apart from other barbarians according to Bjorn. She also realized that there are other enemies besides monsters, but reading is still very difficult. Einar gets up, saying she's going to the sanctuary to learn to read and write with the elders. Before leaving, she remembers that she promised to repay the advice he had given her. She says if he needs help, he should go to the inn of the brave bull, and she'll help him. The barbarian thanks her, and hopes she won't forget that promise because he thinks he'll need her help soon. In the huge library, he doesn't know how he's going to find the book he needs until he sees a large table with a person slumped over it. He gets closer, and the librarian is asleep. He pretends to cough, and the librarian wakes up and looks at him. The librarian asks what he wants, and Bjorn starts to say the book he wants, but he is interrupted. The librarian casts some kind of spell, and he is left wondering if she casts magic magic on him, since nothing changed. She tells the barbarian to take a walk, and she will find what he's looking for, and before he could say anything, she falls asleep again. Walking through the library, he understands how her magic works. The books related to what he was thinking shine on the shelves, and Bjorn picks one to start with. According to the book, due to the witch's curse, no one could live in those lands, and Raftonia, the last fortress, prevented a disaster from happening. So, the royal family created a pathway to another dimension, preventing people from starving, and this pathway is the labyrinth. Bjorn thinks this story is very similar to the beginning of the game. The second book he picks talks about magical crystals that can be transformed into bread and water, among other things. The third book will talk about the wars between elves and barbarians, and the fourth one is what really matters. The topic of the book is demonic spirits that came from another dimension and possessed the body of a person. It seems there's no reason for this to happen, but the royal family and time have been trying to prevent it. Bjorn thinks that as long as he doesn't say anything strange, he'll be fine, which would already classify him as one of those spirits. In the fifth book, which discusses the death of the mortal king, it is said that the king died 150 years ago, while in the game, the king had just died. The next book addresses the dimension's instability, and Bjorn thinks that the blonde he met earlier must have read this book. It still mentions a theory that entering the portal when it's almost closing may relate to stability. Thinking about these things makes the barbarian sad, and he decides to return to the inn. Lying down, he thinks about the time left until the labyrinth opens again, and decides he will look for a partner the next day. The barbarian wakes up to someone knocking on his door and he thinks it must be Erwin. He opens the door, asking what she's doing there so early, and is hit by magic right in the face. Erwin celebrates that she got a contract after trying 10 times with spirit stones. She holds some kind of whirlwind that seems to be a wind spirit, and according to Erwin, it also works well with fire. Bjorn says she's lucky since a spirit stone only gives a 10% chance of getting a contract. 
Besides being very expensive, he asks her to undo the magic, and she is upset because she wanted to show more. But according to the barbarian, she has already destroyed enough of his house, and it's only now that she notices the mess she caused and starts apologizing desperately. She leaves the room shining. Bjorn praises her for the contract, but says she doesn't need to spend time coming to him, and should use that time more wisely. Erwin agrees, but she's upset because she wanted to show him the spirit. Bjorn wonders if she thinks and has some kind of connection with him, and to stay just as a friend, he tells her that he intends to stay in the city, and if she has problems, she can come to him. The elf blushes at what he just said, and smiles at the barbarian. Surely she interpreted what he said differently? Bjorn goes to the inn that Einar indicated to him, and as soon as he arrives, he is recognized by another barbarian. Bjorn has barely arrived and is already annoyed by the shouting. One of the barbarians asks if he wants to stay at the inn too since it costs only 300 crystals per night. Probably because barbarians sleep piled on top of each other. Bjorn says he only came to talk to Einar before the conversation ends. She appears in the hallway where he is. Einar asks what he's doing there, and Bjorn asks for a favor, that she trains fighting with him. It seems like a favor, since he could just go to the field where there are several barbarians training and fighting together. But as he asked, Einar agreed to fight him at any time except in the morning and he wants to fight immediately. They both prepare to start the fight, and Bjorn runs towards her because he doesn't plan on losing. Aina raises her sword to attack, and in just one blow, the barbarian is defeated. She asks if he's okay, and he asks to fight again, knowing she is really strong. They fight several more times, and Bjorn is already on his knees while holding the sword until Einar is tired too, and they decide to stop there. The barbarian asks if she will return to the labyrinth alone, and she says yes since she doesn't have money to form a group, so he invites her to be his companion. She looks a bit surprised as he explains that he will take 80% of the profits, but will pay all the fees. She says she doesn't need any more explanations, and the barbarian is worried that she will refuse the offer, but she takes his hand, agreeing. According to her, there's no point in explaining because she won't understand, so she will just trust him. The next day they go to the barbarian's sanctuary, and the elder asks Bjorn if he went there to learn to read and write too. Bjorn explains that he went there in search of the spiritual seal, more specifically the immortal seal, as he will need it if he wants to pass through the labyrinth. According to Bjorn, elves can make contracts with spirits and use their powers. Dwarves have the blessing of steel that enhances the power of items. Demi-humans can make contracts with ancestral beasts. And finally, barbarians have the spiritual seal. The elder starts asking how Bjorn knows about the seal because a young man like him wouldn't know about it. The young barbarian only learned about the seal because he read it in a book, and that's what he tells the elder, besides mentioning that the seal helped in the war against the elves. The elder laughs and slaps Bjorn on the back, saying there's no need to deny his spiritualism. When the barbarian was about to say something, the elder demanded 800,000 crystals for the seal. Bjorn was already expecting this, and says he will pay. During the game, he had already learned that the seal was expensive. He offers 500,000 crystals and 3 coins worth 100,000, and the elder becomes suspicious about how the barbarian got this amount. The question was already expected, and Bjorn says he found a wounded elf on the first floor, used her as a slave to get the crystals in exchange for an essence, and even took money from this elf's sister, not that it's a lie. The elder starts laughing at the story, and several other barbarians celebrate Bjorn's achievement. The elder offers a gift to the barbarian, and he sees that they are two coins of a hundred thousand. He gets so excited about earning easy money that he even starts shouting that he will continue mistreating the elves. According to the barbarian, the seal is a type of enhancement technique that allows the body to absorb the essence of magical ingredients and create a special power. Barbarians tattoo their babies because their souls are pure, and thus the path of the soul will remain visible even when they are adults. Before handing over the seal, the wizard warns the barbarian that he won't be able to revert it, and from what our barbarian says, the seal is the essence of a tank. The wizard appears with a needle and says he will begin. He gives several pricks to Bjorn's back, and by his expression, 
it's extremely painful. He manages to activate the first level of the seal, and his natural regeneration increases significantly, with an additional 13 physical points. The barbarian thanks him and leaves the hut with a sore back. And the wizard laughs because it's the first time a barbarian has thanked him. Bjorn tries to leave quickly, thinking he said something strange. It dawns, and the barbarian goes to the city to buy equipment. He has already noticed that he is much better using shields than swords. He goes to a shop, and the vendor shows weapons that barbarians prefer. But none of them is what the barbarian is looking for until he finds a mace that seems perfect for him. With the new weapon, his item level increases by 85. He also buys a customized helmet and half-plate armor. The helmet adds 47 more item levels, and the armor adds 57. Bjorn has established a routine outside the labyrinth. He has breakfast with Erwin, spends the afternoon in the library, and always dines somewhere different to gather information, even if the food isn't always good. In the late afternoon, he always trains with the other barbarians, where he can rely solely on his instincts. Many of his skills improve with the training, and he manages to defeat Einar several times, even giving her combat tips. After training, Bjorn returns home, and Erwin always shows up, asking to have dinner with him. After dinner, she bids farewell and wishes the barbarian luck in the labyrinth, which restarts the next day. Now Bjorn's attributes are much better. In the morning, Bjorn and Einar request the unity magic, and the attendant explains that they just need to place their hands on a crystal, and as nothing in this world is free, it costs 15,000 crystals, but it allows them to start the maze together. The guild attendant explains to them that the higher the rank, the more expensive the magic will be, and it only lasts for 24 hours. In a tavern, Einar is speechless in front of a lavish table, after Bjorn ordered the best dishes before entering the maze. She almost cries because the food is so delicious, and she gets excited to work hard. A few minutes before the portal opens, the two are already waiting. The barbarian hears people talking loudly and turns around. Several barbarians who have just passed the coming-of-age ceremony are coming. Einar looks at them with nostalgia, as if it had been a long time since she went through that. The portal finally opens, and Bjorn asks Einar to wait a bit because he wants to test the theory. She doesn't worry about understanding why. She just agrees and follows him, but with one minute left to close, she's already desperate. Bjorn looks at the size of the portal until they shout that it's about to close, and they both run towards the portal. They enter the dark region just as Bjorn planned, and he lights a torch. Einar draws his attention to something. It's a monument. And just as he expected, the monument can take them directly to the second floor. Touching the monument, a light starts emanating from it, and the portal to the second floor opens before them. While Einar didn't even understand what was going on, the barbarian is ready to enter the portal. Bjorn gains two more XP for being the first to open the portal, levels up, and increases his essence capacity by one. Einar is curious about how Bjorn took them to the second level, and according to him, he just read it in a book. From the looks of it, they probably went to the land of the dead. Bjorn asks if his partner is feeling something strange too. He feels like something is filling his body from the inside, and she explains that it must be his spirit status rising. The barbarian explains that there are levels like in the game. As the level increases, both the MP and the amount of essence that can be absorbed also increase. Einar finds it strange that his level has risen without killing any monsters. The barbarian explains to us that it is only possible to gain one experience point per type of slain monster, but whenever you open the portal first, you can gain, making it an easier way to obtain XP. And he doesn't intend to reveal this easier way to anyone. He even asks Einar not to tell anyone that they reached the second level so quickly. Experienced explorers will arrive soon, and if they see them, they will ask how they ended up there, so it's better to get away from the portal. Bjorn ties the torch to his helmet to make it more practical, and since the fire is magical, it not only does not go out but also does not heat up. In the land of the dead, monsters are stronger than in the goblins' land, but at least they don't have traps, which makes the place much better for the barbarians. Einar realizes that something is coming. It's a small group of ghouls, but that already gets her excited to finally have someone to fight. The warrior advances towards them and defeats them all in the blink of an eye. She already believes that this level will be easy until she hears a scream and gets scared. Bjorn explains that it must be a banshee, and it's better to leave it alone, as the creature won't attack them. Einar continues to be afraid, asking if it's not a dangerous monster, and according to Bjorn, if they attack first, they will be cursed. 
Besides, they will be followed by her to the end of the maze, which only makes Einar even more scared. Another scream echoes, and she grabs Bjorn by the neck. This time skeletons appear, and she realizes that she got scared for nothing. Bjorn tries to tell her the weak point of the skeletons, but she simply destroys them all, without even listening to her companion. They continue heading north for almost eight hours. Along the way, they encounter ancient ghouls and mutant skeletons carrying weapons, but none of them are difficult to defeat. The fights improve Bjorn's skills, and he destroys the monsters with his mace. The new armor helped a lot in the warrior's defense, and the helmet can stop arrows and not just carry candles. Looking at Einar, she is also not behind in destructive power. The barbarian realizes that she screams Vihela, the name of the barbarian deity, all the time. Even without knowing why, he starts screaming too and has fun fighting with his companion. He also gains several XP points by defeating new monsters. Einar notices that Bjorn's arm is injured, but he doesn't even worry because the wound starts healing on its own. Einar gets excited about the healing power and asks if it's the effect of the seal. The barbarian reveals that the first level of the seal improves regeneration and increases vigor. They realize that the terrain has changed, and the banshee's scream is louder now. From now on, rank 8 monsters will start appearing. A guttural scream begins to echo, and the death demon appears. They say that the monster eats the maze's light. Bjorn reminds Einar to attack the monster by the head, and they start attacking. The creature, which is not weak, manages to block Einar's attacks and has skin as hard as stone. Bjorn manages to get the monster's attention, and Einar attacks from behind. But even with the accurate attack, the blade hardly penetrates the monster, which turns around and throws the warrior. She gets up, leaning on the sword, and shouts that the monster is very strong. The barbarian remembers that even in the game, the monster's defense was very strong and also had a high healing power. The demon starts screaming. And this time, even Bjorn gets scared because he knows what that means. The monster activated the ability to summon ghouls. Dozens of them appear to be to be heading towards the barbarians. Bjorn shouts for Einar to deal with the ghouls first while he goes to attack the death demon. The barbarian heads towards the monster holding his shield, but the monster attacks, forcing him to retreat. Bjorn advances towards the monster again and holds it with the shield. While Einar has already defeated all the ghouls, he asks her not to get distracted and attacks the monster once again with his mace. Now the two barbarians are attacking the monster together and finally manage to hit the creature in the head. Bjorn thinks that finally one of the attacks has taken effect, but the monster doesn't give up and throws the warrior backwards. Bjorn gets up injured, and looking at the monster, the wound on his head is already practically healed. Bjorn looks at the monster, thinking of a strategy to win, and Einar grabs the demon by the leg, exerting force while trying to unbalance the creature, and succeeds as the monster ends up falling backwards. The barbarians take advantage of the opportunity to finish off the demon while it's still on the ground, and even gain another 2 XP. The demon leaves behind a large magical crystal, but according to the barbarian, it's only worth 100 crystals, and if combined with the ghouls, it's worth 300. Even though she only got a little, risking her life, Einar is excited to continue hunting monsters. Bjorn began to think that it's not so bad to hunt with a barbarian, since Erwin was a bit passive. The two encounter more death demons and defeat them by throwing off their balance, and then hitting their heads as if tenderizing meat. They manage to defeat about 70 of them in doing so. Who was searching for a demon essence to synchronize with his seal, ended up with none on the first day. On the second day, the demons began to appear in pairs, and even so, it wasn't so difficult. The only complication was if they delayed in the slaughter, as they could be surrounded by ghouls. In the afternoon, they began to appear in groups of three, and the barbarians realized that it was too much even for them to face. Other explorers show up, and before the barbarian could say anything, Einar interrupts and threatens the group. They are so scared that they run away from the warrior. She tells Bjorn that it's better to find another place to camp since the humans know their location and are not trustworthy. They continue walking, and Bjorn thinks that she must not have had a good experience with humans either. They are discussing how they won't find any good place to camp until they hear a voice asking for help. Further ahead, there are several bodies of adventurers with traces of poison, the duo freezes, and a plunderer who seems very powerful appears before them. 
The plunderers make money hunting explorers instead of killing monsters. This activity is punishable by death. But just like the barbarian put an end to the explorers who abused him, if no one speaks up about it, people from the outside won't know. The plunderer asks if it's the first time they've encountered someone like her. The barbarian is already cautious because she seems dangerous. He takes a good look at the enemy in front of him. From her characteristics, she must be excellent at what she does since he's never heard of this plunderer. Einar is almost drawing her sword and tells Bjorn that she thinks she must be strong. Looking at the defeated explorers, they have no external injuries and seem to have been poisoned. So the barbarian asks if she wasn't a companion of the group, and she reveals, turning her back, that they were her companions. She starts gathering the group's items in a magic pouch and casually calls for the barbarians. They are apprehensive, and Einar asks if they should fight her. But after seeing how strong she seems, Bjorn decides it's better for them to flee from her. The plunderer glances back, and the two barbarians are running at full speed to escape. Bjorn begins to see the signs he left along the way to guide them back to the first floor. Midway, they abruptly stop upon encountering a group of four human explorers. Einar is already ready to fight, but her companion says they are fleeing and need help. Bjorn swears by his warrior's honor that he's not lying. The group seems to believe the barbarian, and their leader says that if they defeat the plunderer, they will get the entire reward. He asks the duo to approach because he will use his gnome ability on them, and they won't be noticed. This ability can disguise the user and their companions within a 3 meter radius, as long as they don't move. The barbarian approaches, and the leader begins to say that they were very lucky since they managed to catch two barbarians in their trap. The duo seems to be hit by some magic that paralyzes them, and Bjorn realizes that this group is also made up of plunderers. The only way he can think that an explorer of the same level would have it would be with the essence of the stone golem suppression. If he takes damage, Bjorn knows he'll get rid of the ability, and the plunderers comment on how much they'll gain from the barbarians. One of them holds Einar's face, and his colleague says they were lucky, since barbarian hearts are very valuable. One of the plunderers even jokes with the barbarian, saying that his gaze won't set him free. The guy takes out a knife to deliver the final blow. He hits the neck. The barbarian, who was preparing to take as little damage as possible, manages to move away before the knife enters too much. He can finally move and hits the plunderer in the face, surprising the rest of the group. The barbarian removes the knife from his neck and throws it towards Einar, who is hit near the chest. Even in a combat position, Bjorn is very injured and ends up falling to his knees. Einar grabs her sword and slices the plunderers, until only the leader is left, who runs away. Now she looks towards her companion, and he looks terrible. She starts screaming for him to stay alive, swearing revenge, while he is trying to ask for a potion. At least with the near-death experience, his mentality increased by three. After taking the potion, and with the help of the seal, the warrior's neck heals quickly. Einar even congratulates him for being the only barbarian with a scar on his neck. Now recovered, the warrior wants to go after the leader of the plunderers, and they actually manage to capture the guy. But instead of killing him, Bjorn wants to use his ability to hide from that woman. Suddenly, someone shoots a dart and hits the plunderer directly in the neck. The two look at the guy's body while the plunderer approaches. She reveals that she watched their fight with the group, and Bjorn shouts to Aina that it's time for them to attack. The two run towards the woman, who seems very calm, even with two barbarians about to attack her at the same time. The plunderer dodges Einar's attack and still manages to block Bjorn's. The barbarian wonders how many essences she must have to be so strong. He gives up the weapon and tries to push his opponent while shouting for Einar to attack her. Suddenly, the warrior falls to his knees, powerless. He has been stabbed by the plunderer's dagger. Bjorn thinks if she's an aura user, they don't stand a chance. Meanwhile, Einar attacks from behind, but the plunderer retaliates so swiftly that she has no time to defend herself. The plunderer is using a paralyzing poison, rendering the barbarians immobile. Bjorn thinks she's much stronger, and they stand no chance. She points the dagger at the warrior's face and unexpectedly offers to spare his life if he swears not to tell anyone he saw her. She explains she never intended to kill the barbarians from the start because she owes a debt to their kind, and Bjorn realizes that's why she merely watched them get attacked. Einar pleads with the warrior not to trust the plunderer, believing she's merely toying with them. Bjorn asks what would happen if he refused the offer, and she says she would kill them, as that's the promise. Before Bjorn could inquire about which promise she's referring to, 
she dismisses it as none of his concern. Then the warrior swears by his honor, to which she claims he's different from the other barbarians, and pours some kind of potion on him. Now it's Einar's turn to respond, but she refuses, surprising her companion. The plunderer raises the dagger to end the barbarian, and Bjorn desperately urges his companion to swear. Einar tries to say something about the honor of barbarians, but Bjorn insists she said she would do as he commanded and should trust him. The barbarian still seems reluctant, but at least makes the oath. Before the plunderer leaves, Bjorn asks which floor she came from, and she came from the eighth. This means the barbarians only stayed alive because of the promise they made. As she departs, the barbarian thinks that next time they meet, it won't end like this. The duel returns to the first floor. This time, it's Einar who falls flat on the ground after exiting the portal. Bjorn asks if she's okay, and from the ground, she responds she's no longer a warrior. Bjorn says survival is for the strongest, for they'll have a second chance. And she tries to understand that, knowing one day they'll seek revenge. They pause to rest, and even though exhausted, the barbarian can't sleep. He's not as bad as Einar, but still feels humiliated, just like when the blonde guy saved him and the priestess refused to heal him. So the swordsman gave him a potion, which he drank like a dog. In that situation, the barbarian chose to save himself. He focused on what needed to be done at that moment. He remembers seeing someone being decapitated and the various other madness that has occurred since he entered that world. All he could do was try to stay alive. Bjorn is determined that's not how he wants to live his life. He wakes Einar up, asking if she would accept a means to become stronger, even if dangerous. And of course, she would. She knows they'll die if they don't get stronger. Bjorn begins to explain his plan to his companion. They'll enter the rupture and search for chaos. On the first floor, they gain more XP by defeating different monsters, reaching a darker part where four types of monsters appear at once. They arrive at a stone, and Bjorn explains it's a memorial for those who discovered the labyrinth, with a quote written on it, the same as in the game, meaning the hidden condition must also be the same. Bjorn will open the rupture, and from then on, it's a secret, and Einar vows not to tell anything. But she asks what this rupture is, and according to the barbarian, it's the labyrinth within the labyrinth. The rupture on the first floor requires magic crystals from four types of monsters on the memorial stone, and a magical crystal of eighth rank from the second floor. The rupture opens an instance dungeon with a capacity for five people, and the difficulty depends on the number of members. In the game, a rupture would only open after three months in the city's time, and people found ways to force their opening. Out of the four ruptures on the first floor, they entered one with a red sky and crows flying towards the black castle. Even though Bjorn knows which rupture they are entering, he feels suffocated, but at least knows he can complete it. The rupture opens again behind them, and the barbarians look at who's coming. In another part of the labyrinth, Rowan is exploring and being criticized by her sister for using the bow and a spirit to defend herself. Owen says that according to Bjorn, she should specialize in what she's good at, trust her team, and do her role the best way possible. But for her sister, a teammate is just a teammate, and shouldn't be valued much. And Erwin ends up agreeing and asks if they can't go to the next floor. According to her sister, they can't just hunt a bit on the second floor, and instead, they'll enter a rupture. As the rupture cycle is up to eight months, one should be about to open. The sister thinks Bjorn must not have told Erwin anything because he doesn't know about the ruptures and asks Erwin to trust her, and she'll become stronger. A sound emerges before she could finish her sentence, and a rupture begins to open. The two run towards the rupture, but before they could touch it, the rupture closes. Back with the barbarians, the first one to come out of the rupture is a dwarf, soon followed by a mage. The group is curious as to why there are still mages on the first floor. Einar asks if a mage is really that good, since the librarian is also a mage. Bjorn explains that she's a ninth rank mage, and that mages are an important resource for the city, so having a mage there means she's skilled. The girl compliments the barbarian's intelligence. She introduces herself as a sixth rank mage Alua Raven, and the guy behind her is finally introduced as the carrier she hired, Tarjean. The dwarf also introduces himself as Hykerod Mirad, claiming to be an explorer for three years. The barbarian duo also introduces themselves. Looking at them, Bjorn asks how they got there, as they don't seem like first floor explorers. The two simply say they heard the rupture was about to open. The mage says the loot will be divided among everyone except the carrier, and they agree, since it seems to be customary to follow the mage in the labyrinth. Bjorn was about to say he agrees with her, but Einar interrupts, saying she doesn't 
doesn't agree with that. Instead, she wants Bjorn to lead the group, since he's better than a normal barbarian. The other members don't know how to react. Einar remains determined that Bjorn should lead the group, pointing to him, saying the barbarian is the best warrior. The rest of the group is speechless with her fervor, and Bjorn is embarrassed by the situation. The dwarf even says he envies the respect she has for her husband, and she now says she's not his wife. While the two argue, the mage says it's better for them to go, as there's much to explore in that place. The dwarf asks if it wouldn't be better to know each other's abilities first, but according to the mage, the monsters are so weak that only she and her carrier would be able to defeat them, and of course, this irritates the other members of the group. She also says she'll take the Guardian's loot because they need it for her research. He shouts if he looks like an idiot to her. As always, the division of the group's profits causes fights among its members. The Guardian's loot is the rupture flower. For a mage, this is a priority, but what matters most now is money. The mage says she'll give all the crystals she earns in the rupture in exchange. But for the dwarf, this just means the group will end up with the crumbs. The mage says she'll also let them keep the items. But the dwarf still thinks it's better for them to decide by luck which of the two gets the rupture loss. The barbarian joins the discussion because if it continues like this, the gains will only be for the mage and the dwarf. He doesn't want the essence or the items just the rupture stone. Now the mage and the dwarf think he asked for too much. Bjorn agrees to give up the stone in exchange for two essences that aren't from the guardian. The dwarf and the mage exchange glances and in the end agree to the request since there shouldn't be any interesting essences for them there according to their levels. Now the mage and the dwarf walk together as if nothing had happened. Looking at how he couldn't even argue with the two, Bjorn knows he needs to get stronger. The castle is divided into four chapters, the drawbridge at the entrance, the courtyard surrounded by the outer walls, the underground prison in the inner area, and the demon worship room inside the castle lord's chamber. The castle entrance is guarded by gargoyles, eighth rank monsters. Once they sense an enemy, they attack using their petrification ability, and the most common way to defeat them is to sacrifice a group member while others attack. Einar tries to help the companion but is stopped by the mage. She casts a spell capable of cancelling the gargoyle's curse. The gargoyle without abilities is just an easily defeated monster by anyone in the group. The dwarf praises the strength of the companions. Bjorn thinks the dwarf is also very skilled. Einar notices that the magic crystals are moving by themselves, and the mage explains she's using magic to collect them and will distribute the crystals along the way. The group continues advancing through the castle and reaches a darker area. Raven casts a spell to illuminate the place, revealing several monsters in a corner called Dead Men. They have no rank, give no XP or crystals. They conclude it would be a waste of mana to use magic on these creatures. So, the barbarians and the dwarf attack these monsters. When Bjorn attacks the last of them, he realizes the creature dropped a dead man commander's horn. They reach a steel door, and the dwarf won't be able to destroy it with the axe. So Raven destroys the door with an explosive magic. The group reaches the drawbridge the first chapter of the castle. The mage asks Sinar to blow the horn. The warrior takes a breath and starts blowing. This activates the dormant magic seal, and Einar is surprised to see the bridge descending. The moat water also starts rising, and Einar can see hands of several dead men in the water. The mage tells her not to worry about it. Dead men start rising from the moat. Raven was already prepared for this and gathers the surrounding group. The mage attacks the dead men with magic, defeating all of them. Bjorn is realizing she is more powerful than he thought. She triumphantly says all they have to do now is wait for the bridge to descend, and as soon as it does, they head towards the castle. Bjorn walks, thinking it was too easy to finish this chapter. After crossing the bridge, they enter the outer castle. Raven casts a spell, and most of the monsters surrounding the group end up defeated. For Bjorn, even though she didn't manage to kill them all as before, she is still very powerful. With just one magic, she defeated 90% of the monsters. Death demons that can heal were not affected by the magic, and the mage lets the companions defeat what's left of the monsters. The barbarians join forces to defeat the death demons, and the dwarf is shocked watching, thinking this is how the barbarians hunt. Raven casts a spell on the death demons, worsening their wounds, and without the power of regeneration, these monsters become extremely weak. Looking at Raven, Einar says she now knows why mages are praised. Raven listens to what Einar says and starts boasting about her skills, saying it takes both study and talent to become powerful. 
By advancing quickly thanks to the spells, the group helps Raven collect materials for her research. The barbarian notices something strange after inspecting the area. They didn't destroy the statue that seems to guard some item, and he thinks the group shouldn't know about it. As the barbarian tried to interact with any suspicious object in the game, he was able to discover several hidden things. To avoid suspicion, he thinks it's better not to say anything about the statue. They continue walking and reach the inner castle. The mage and the dwarf seem disappointed that there isn't much to take or monsters in this location. They go down a staircase towards the underground and enter the first floor of the underground prison. The dwarf asks the mage what kind of monsters appear there. Of the various ones she mentioned, body golems are exclusive to the castle. The dwarf is eager to fight these golems for the first time, and the mage takes the opportunity to warn about the explosive bodies. Even though, according to her, she would protect the group before anything happened. Einar asks Bjorn if the skeletal little creatures were monsters too. Raven starts talking about them, and Einar gets angry because she didn't ask her. The mage is annoyed by Einar's response, and suddenly they hear a scream. Immediately Einar is frightened by the banshee and grabs Bjorn. Raven takes advantage of the situation to scare Einar even more saying it would be terrible if she encountered a banshee. And Bjorn says that mages must know how to deal with these monsters. Now, even the mage recognizes he must be intelligent. She casts a spell and destroys one of the banshees. Others throw themselves towards her, and she destroys all of them. Raven calls the companions to continue, and they are all amazed by her power. They enter the second floor of the underground prison, an area with several disgusting monsters and objects. The group stops in front of a wall. According to Raven, Raven, there is a hidden door behind this wall and a body golem waiting for them on the other side. They leave their backpacks before entering. Bjorn lights his torch. As soon as they open the door, they smell the horrible odor of several bodies thrown in front of them. They continue walking. The first to feel sick is the carrier, and soon after Raven, even used to dissections, she couldn't stand the smell. The dwarf is relieved that at least the barbarians are fine. In front of them is a mountain of bodies, and a voice seems to come from them, and the whole group is scared. Looking closely at the mountain, it was actually a body golem. Bjorn shouts for the group to prepare for combat, but the dwarf is petrified. The voices of the various bodies that form the golem continue asking for help. Either the dwarf nor the mage will be able to fight in this state. This time the fight will depend on the barbarian duo. One of the things that caught attention in the game were the great illustrations it had. Even people who didn't play ended up knowing the images, yet the barbarian realized they didn't compare to the reality he was experiencing. All the tough guys in the group, who treated the barbarians as if they were nothing, are in no condition to fight. Now they are the ones who need to defeat the monster. Einar shouts for the rest of the group to do something. At that moment a monster is coming towards them. Einar has to block the attack because the dwarf can't even move. Yet some acid fluid falls into his eyes, and he screams in pain. Now he really won't be able to do anything. In a corner, the mage continues to be out of combat vomiting. Bjorn asks Einar to protect the mage and the dwarf while drawing the monster's attention. According to the barbarian, the golem of bodies throws explosive corpses at the distant enemies and tries to grab those nearby to eat. If the barbarian gets too close, the golem will focus on the mage, and that would be terrible for the group since she still can't fight. Bjorn needs to keep a certain distance and buy time until she recovers. At least she seems to have stopped vomiting. Raven looks towards the creature and sets the monster on fire with magic. The barbarians are surprised by her power once again. Just one fire magic of hers destroyed the first pattern of the golem. But it seems this wasn't the end of this monster. A hand emerges from the midst of the flames. The monster has a second phase, a golem of skeletons. Bjorn shouts to Einar that it's not over yet, and they both rush to attack the golem's chest, which is a rank 7 monsters, but without the external body, it won't be difficult for the barbarians to defeat it, they hit the golem's chest, and the monster is defeated. Bjorn looks at what's left of the golem, it leaves behind a shining ball, which surprises the barbarians because it's their essence. In the rupture, more high-ranking monsters appear, and it becomes easier to gain XP. The Guardian's loot is also highly desired by explorers, but the main thing is that the essence drop increases a lot. Therefore, 
It's strange that they took so long to get one. Bjorn says it's their right to keep the essence since they defeated the monster, while the rest of the group was mostly unwell. Bjorn wanted the essences of the death demon with regeneration power, and the chimera wolf with strength power. He didn't expect to get the essence of the golem of bodies, which only appears once in the castle. Besides, the golem's attributes are perfect for a tanker. Even though it gets slower, other attributes would compensate for it, such as pain tolerance, strength, and poison resistance. The problem is the ability that comes with it. Even though it's very powerful, it consumes the user's life. The passive is also complicated because the acidic blood will ruin the equipment if it hits him. Bjorn thinks it's better to wait a bit, since the essence won't disappear for at least 30 minutes while he thinks about whether it's worth it. After taking a potion, the dwarf feels ashamed of his behavior in battle, and Bjorn says that if it weren't for Einar, he wouldn't have survived. The barbarian thinks that even though his group is strong, they don't have enough mental strength. Even the mage apologizes for her behavior, and Bjorn takes this opportunity to talk about the monster they defeated. She interrupts saying that she still managed to use magic despite her condition, realizing he'll end up up with nothing if he doesn't do something. Bjorn says they saved the group, and the mage wants to know what he means by that. The barbarian is quite clear in saying he wants to keep the rupture stone, and that doesn't seem to sit well with the group. The dwarf breaks the silence, agreeing with the barbarian, as he would have died if it weren't for them. Raven doesn't approve and says that if they find another stone, they could give them a chance. The barbarian seems to be content with that, and takes the opportunity to say that the golem left in essence. Now the whole group is surprised. According to the mage, the golem's essence is even rarer than the guardian's. She already begins to think about how it would be to research such an essence, and this is the barbarian's chance to start the negotiation. He offers the golem's essence in exchange for the guardian's essence, leaving the mage in doubt about which essence would be more important to her. Raven asks the Barbarian if he really wants to trade the Golem Essence for the Guardians, even though it's not certain that the Guardian will leave one, and the Barbarian takes the risk. She agrees to the exchange, since she's much more interested in the Golem Essence. Bjorn got what he wanted, and the Dwarf asks if the Mage will give the Essence to the Carrier, since she can't absorb it. She says no, holding a test tube, an item that, according to the Barbarian, is only worthwhile for a high rank essence. As the dwarf himself notes it's extremely expensive. She probably used her only two because body golems are very rare. After taking the essence, they continue advancing excitedly. They enter a dark room. The dwarf asks what those creatures are, and according to the mage, they must be just statues. They must be near the lord of the castle's quarters. She touches the statue's face, and a book falls from a fissure in the ceiling, and she picks it up as if expecting it to happen. The dwarf even asks if she knew about it. According to Bjorn, that's a book about dark magic that's worth a lot on the black market. Since the barbarian missed his chance to grab the book, Raven says she'll keep it. Surely she knows how valuable it is. Seeing that she knew about the book, the barbarian wonders how she didn't know about the statue at the fountain. Passing through the demon worshippers room, they fight gargoyles, wolves, chimeras, and the skeleton knight, the second mini-boss. Raven celebrates that they found the golem essence, and now a desire-type skeleton knight. The barbarian agrees and explains that this monster can have three types of attributes. Sadness that uses a mist-inducing psychosis, hatred that can lower the opponent's level, and desire type, which can regenerate. Raven offers to neutralize the monster's ability with a magic injury intensification, and the barbarian duo attacks the knight. The skeleton knight leaves in essence. It seems the adventurers are luckier now. The dwarf congratulates the barbarians for getting another essence, and Bjorn tells Einar to keep it since the essence suits the swordsman. Since they entered the labyrinth, he felt that Einar was trustworthy. The warrior is thrilled to receive the essence, and begins to absorb it. Bjorn just forgot to tell her one detail about the essence. Her body would change drastically. Looking at the group, she asks why Bjorn seems bigger, and the rest of the group also seems to have grown. Bjorn explains that it wasn't them who grew but she who shrunk. As the mage confirms, the essence's effect provides denser bones in exchange for smaller bones. She tries to continue explaining, but Einar lets out a deafening scream. She panics because now she won't be recognized as a warrior, as if being a woman wasn't enough. Raven says she looks much prettier now, 
and could even be sold to nobles for her beauty. Bjorn tries to console his devastated companion for no longer looking like a warrior. The mage asks if she could examine her when they return to the city. Bjorn tells her not to be sad, at least to try the essence, as a death demon has just appeared. This is a great opportunity. She agrees to face the monster dejectedly. The demon prepares to attack, and with just one blow, she splits it in half. Even Raven is speechless at her companion's increased power. Bjorn tries to cheer her up again, saying how she has become stronger, and with tears in her eyes, she says she's still a warrior, not just a warrior, a powerful warrior. They reach the door leading to the Guardian's room and chat casually because the rift is ending. The Barbarian thinks they were lucky since they got most of the loot. He wonders if he's ever been this lucky in his life, and what could be worse if the worst happened. The Dwarf is about to open the door when Bjorn notices that the doorknob's color is odd and shouts for him not to open it. It's too late, and he's already started opening it. The door swings open completely, and the castle's master is now awake. Even the mage says something's wrong because a death knight should have appeared. The creature says it's been a long time since it saw anyone, and the mage realizes it's a vampire, a monster that appears above the sixth floor and is rarely a mutation. The vampire duke asks in a frightening manner where they came from. Monsters are divided into four variants. The mutant variant monsters have different classes. The advanced, the monster is larger than the average on the floor. The rare variant are monsters that are only found in ruptures like golem or mimics and finally, the advanced monsters that have their own memories and have a name. The group flees from the vampire they just encountered. Bjorn who knows this monster knows that he is powerful both in combat and in dark magic. Raven says that a mutant variant had never appeared as guardian and even the barbarian with thousands of hours had never encountered a vampire duke. He only knows that this monster existed because he watched a stream. The mage asks how he knew about the monster, because he asked the dwarf not to open the door, and he just says to keep running and only had a feeling that something was wrong. He only noticed the color of the doorknob because after watching hours of video, it was the only thing that changed to find the vampire. And he thinks that if he hadn't been so excited, he would have noticed it earlier. The dwarf says that it's no use running since they need to defeat the monster to leave the rupture. But Bjorn wants at least to find sunlight. Before finding any light, they hear the voice of the vampire lord, who appears floating in front of them. Raven asks his companions to close their eyes and casts a light spell. When the warrior opens his eyes, the vampire is disappearing, but he was not defeated. He used magic to escape and with that the group gained at least a few minutes. The dwarf shouts to the barbarian that the mage has fainted. She is injured inside and according to Bjorn, the essence of the vampire doesn't have this effect unless it's from another monster. Even in the video he watched, the player just died without doing anything. Bjorn shouts for the group to get out of there immediately and the dwarf says that only the mage knows the way. But according to the barbarian, he also knows because he managed to memorize it. They run trying to stay as far away as possible from that monster. Finally they manage to see the exit. When Bjorn looks back, the vampire is coming after them. They run to climb the stairs and leave the underground. Fortunately they all manage to get out. Looking back, they only see the shadow of the vampire that cannot climb due to sunlight. The group is out of breath. The dwarf says that the barbarian really managed to memorize the way and asks if he really left the coming of age ceremony just a month ago. Einar says that his companion is a great warrior and according to the dwarf, he can become one. The sun will set soon and Bjorn says they need to reach the walls for shelter. Even if they have to carry the mage, the carrier tries to say she needs to rest. But according to the barbarian it's better for him to start walking if he wants to stay alive. They need to protect the mage even if it risks their lives and the carrier ends up agreeing. Bjorn takes advantage while the group is preparing and goes to retrieve the item he left behind. He cuts off the head of the statue. Hidden in its neck was a healing item that also serves to attack demons the tears of the goddess. Back with the group, Bjorn asks how the mage is doing and talks to her that the vampire will return as soon as the sun sets. He takes the opportunity to ask what happened to her, and she thinks it was a damage exchange. In 20 minutes she will be able to cast some spells again, but nothing too powerful. Then the barbarian asks if she knows any solar magic, which she considers extremely rude. At this moment the barbarian doesn't care about manners, he wants to survive. The mage makes a disgusted face, but says 
she can cast spheres of solar spots, which is a rank 6 magic with solar attribute. Bjorn wants to know if she can use a tribute reinforcement with the magic, but she will only be able to do so after more time. According to the barbarian, he will hold the monster until she has enough mana. She begins to agree with the barbarian, but suddenly asks why he's acting as the leader, not realizing that at this moment, he's the most capable for it. Remembering how the barbarian has behaved so far, the dwarf says he's good at judging character and trusts him. Bjorn thanks him. Night falls, and the vampire monster returns, literally thirsty for blood, and the group needs to hold it off until the magic is ready. The vampire prepares to attack the group. Bjorn asks the carrier to take the mage away and thinks that just like in the game, even with intellect, the most players can do is exchange a few words with the enemy. The vampire shows its claws and heads towards the group. The dwarf manages to block the attack and says the enemy is powerful. Even a powerful creature like that can't move the dwarf. This is thanks to the essence of a rank 7 monster that the dwarf possesses, balance of weight. It enables impact absorption and resistance to pushes while the feet are on the ground. While the dwarf holds the vampire, Bjorn and Einar run to attack. They split up and Einar tries to attack from behind, but the vampire dodges and retreats. That's what they were expecting, as Bjorn is right behind him. The warrior attacks and manages to hit the vampire, who immediately retreats. At this moment Bjorn feels intense pain in his hand. It must be the vampire's pain exchange ability. He didn't seem to suffer practically any damage from the attack. His body starts to transform into crows that fly towards the group and the dwarf says he will hold the attack and activates the second essence, emergency restoration, which can block most of the crows. Even with the defeated crows, it doesn't seem good if their fluids touch anyone. Strange marks appear on the foreheads of Einar and the dwarf, which means they were hit. This is a vampire ability, the sacrifice seal. In addition to the sacrifice seal, Vampires also have the immortal ability that increases regeneration as they are injured in blood owner that can absorb opponent's abilities by drinking their blood. He can also use dark magic, transforming into smoke to avoid physical damage, turning into explosive crows and summoning blood monsters. With all this power the dwarf can resist the attacks. Einar tries to draw Bjorn's attention to the dwarf's situation and the barbarian is also attacked. With 5 minutes left for the magic to be ready the dwarf is out of combat, and the barbarians are tired. So, Bjorn shouts for Einar to take the dwarf and retreat, while he alone will hold the vampire. She runs carrying the dwarf, and the barbarian is holding off the vampire's attacks only with the shield. He seems to have a plan since he doesn't plan to fight. This time he doesn't block and takes the attack. The vampire seems to have not understood this attitude, and the barbarian takes a potion to regenerate. Even the barbarian's group can't understand what he's planning. He continues to be attacked by the vampire, while taking several potions to heal and feels terrible pain with each one he takes. After drinking several potions, smoke starts to come out of the warrior's body. The attacks don't stop, but this time the barbarian blocks. Even receiving several attacks Bjorn still manages to dodge those coming towards his vital points. Watching the fight, the mage remembers something she had read, which said that a barbarian's strength is in his mentality and not in his physique. Now she seems to understand what the phrase meant. The carrier suggests they flee, but there's nowhere for them to go. Leaving there is defeating the vampire. Raven wonders what she's doing at that moment. Even the barbarian who has just undergone the coming of age ceremony is making more rational decisions than she is. She knows they won't survive without him. So she asks the carrier to flee with the dwarf, so that Einar can come back to help in the fight. She seems to have remembered that a mage doesn't just stay in the rear. She must also try to find a path to victory. The mage looks at the essence of the golem she picked up earlier and knows she needs to make a decision. She looks in the direction of the fight starts to cast a spell. The magic throws the essence towards the barbarian, who certainly wasn't expecting that. The vial breaks upon hitting him and the essence begins to be absorbed automatically. Several of his attributes increase, now that he has the power of the body golem. The barbarian's vision was getting blurry. He kept getting attacked by the vampire, losing his strength, focusing solely on protecting his vital points. Until time seemed to stand still, and he absorbed the essence of the golem. Now the vampire's claws couldn't penetrate the barbarian's bones anymore. But thinking that the mage threw the essence at him, 
he'll have to change his plan of progress. Bjorn is managing to move better, but still can't dodge the attacks properly, and knows he can't continue like this. Another potion is thrown at him, and this time it's a healing one. The mage seems to be getting better. If I keep it up a barbarian will have a chance of winning. Bjorn runs towards the vampire and grabs the monster, who obviously starts tearing him apart. And this time it's not bad, since the power of acidic blood will cause pain to the creature. Another potion is thrown at the barbarian, who besides causing damage to the vampire is also being healed by the essence and the potion. The vampire finds a way to get away from the barbarian, and Einar is coming to help in the battle. She strikes the vampire duke with the sword, and he barely has time to dodge and is already being attacked by Bjorn, but retaliates by hitting the barbarian in the stomach. The warrior can only think about how much time is left for the potion to be ready, and it's precisely at that moment that he hears the mage shouting that she can finally attack. He takes a look at the vampire, grabs the creature by the chest, gathering all his strength he throws the creature and yells for the dwarf to attack. The dwarf starts to glow with lightning ability and attacks the vampire with his hammer. The vampire duke is hit with so much force that he enters a state of unconsciousness. Bjorn grabs the potion he had hidden in his boot, and it seems like he's finally going to use the tears of the goddess. The warrior pours the potion into the vampire's mouth and takes the opportunity to punch him in the face, too. The potion blesses the vampire, and a light starts to emanate from him. The blessing seals all his tolerances, and now he enters a state of paralysis. Raven tells the warrior to get away from the vampire because now she's going to use solar magic. Even though not in her best condition, she casts the magic that goes straight towards the vampire and the barbarian, who looks back thinking there won't be time to escape. The solar magic explodes. Due to the vampire's owner exchange ability the whole group enters a state of unconsciousness. Bjorn wakes up all wounded and wonders if they really managed to defeat the duke. He struggles to get up. But just looking forward, he sees that the vampire was not destroyed, instead activated the immortal ability that greatly increases regeneration. As if that weren't enough also has the ability source of darkness that makes resist death as long as the heart is whole. The vampire begins to heal rapidly, and Bjorn thinks that if it continues like this, soon he will be fully healed. The rest of the group is unconscious, and the only thing the barbarian can think of is that he needs to kill this creature before it finishes regenerating. Bjorn walks up to the vampire. Looking at him the only thing intact is the heart. He follows the arms trying to gather his strength. He punches the vampire's heart and uses his flesh explosion ability. At that moment the barbarian's hands explode, and it begins as this is his only alternative. He continues using the ability until his life reaches less than 1%. He doesn't stop the life reaches zero. And a countdown starts, he continues, and mentality points begin to be consumed. He knows he would end up dying even if he stopped, so he continues until his hands disappear, and he simply falls over the vampire's body thinking of using the remainder of his body in the ability. After all this sacrifice, the Count finally dies. After giving everything he had, Bjorn levels up. But that doesn't mean his life will return. Unexpectedly, as the odds are low, the vampire leaves in essence. And as it is on top of him, Bjorn begins to absorb it. And now his passive ability is not to die until the heart is destroyed. After going through all this, a system window appears saying that the progress is normal, and the administrator is observing this character. Bjorn awakens with a painful expression, and the first person he sees after waking up is Einar. He asks where the rest of the group is, and according to her, they left three days ago. In other words, the barbarian was unconscious all this time. Bjorn thinks the maze is already on the seventh day. He moves his hands and realizes that his body is no longer injured. He also notices something else he is without clothes. Einar says they were worn out, so she threw them away. She reassures him that he doesn't need to worry. She's seen his great warrior. Jokes aside, Bjorn asks what happened while he was unconscious. And Einar says the dwarf took some items and the mage took the stones. Bjorn thinks that since he's alive, it means he absorbed the vampire's essence. And Einar says they were going to split the stones by luck, but the mage refused and took everything. The dwarf didn't do anything, so he didn't care. The mage said Bjorn took the best item, so he can't complain. Bjorn now knows that she also noticed that he absorbed the vampire's essence. Einar says the mage took the items and left without even waiting for Bjorn to wake up. The two barbarians thank each other for trusting one another, and Einar asks if they're going to leave now too. Bjorn says there's still something he needs to do. He's going to retrieve something. Sometime later, 
he returns to the city and exchanges his items for money. He says he got very little, only 231,000. But considering he managed to absorb two essences, it was worth it. When he goes to get his money bag, the woman seems suspicious and doesn't hand it over. Bjorn finds it strange because she never asked anything before. But suddenly, several guards surround him, and he's left completely puzzled. Now that the portal has closed, we also see that the elf has returned safely. But she's very tired, saying that the third floor is very difficult, and that she encountered monsters of 7th and 6th rank. She's in line to collect her money, hoping to find Bjorn to show him the new essence she obtained. She also wants him to test it again. When she arrives at the counter to receive her money, they also suspect her, and 184,000 stones is too much for a 9th ranked explorer. But the elf says she was with her sister, and the guy searches for her name in the book, thus releasing the elf's money. She goes home and takes a bath, starting to change while thinking about Bjorn. When she finishes, she heads to his house, saying she'll pay for dinner because she earned a lot of money. But when she arrives, she discovers that he hasn't returned yet and becomes very worried. After that, a week passes, and the elf returns to see if the barbarian has arrived yet. But she sees the, the owner of the inn dot taking things out of the room. He says he's waited long enough, and the barbarian is probably already dead. Later, we see the elf's sister comforting her, who is lying on the street in the middle of the rain. The sister says she heard the news and staying there won't change anything. The elf says she wants to become stronger to protect the people she cares about. While all this is happening, we finally find out where the barbarian is locked in a cell. It seems he underwent an interrogation because he was carrying some items belonging to other people. He claims that they were from people who attacked him. The interrogator says he will find out the truth. Bjorn suspects something is amiss because there is a law that no one should be questioned about the origin of the item. But the investigator wants to know where the beast the barbarian was carrying came from, and he said he got it from some guys who attacked him. But he didn't mention the redhead because he's not a fool, right? The interrogator questions where the barbarian's scar is after he claims to have been attacked. But only then does he realize that the scar disappeared after he absorbed the essence of the vampire. The interrogator doesn't believe Bjorn entered into a rupture, especially since a vampire supposedly appeared in it. Bjorn becomes angry and orders for a mage to be called to confirm his story. But for the interrogator, it's not worth calling a mage for a rank 9 explorer. Even though Bjorn offers to pay the mage, the interrogator doesn't pay much attention and leaves the room. They end up calling a mage, but Bjorn's mental power is too strong and the spells don't work on him. The interrogator refuses to call a more powerful mage and orders the barbarian to confess what he did. On the seventh day, the man tells Bjorn that there is concrete evidence against him. The interrogator has the message stone that the barbarian took from the looters. He received a testimony from the guild the looters were a part of regarding what the barbarian did. And because of this, Bjorn will be executed in three hours. In the cell, Bjorn accepts that the situation won't be resolved through conversation. He needs to prove his innocence somehow. The barbarian grabs the bars and activates the flesh explosion. He walks out of the destroyed cell and the guard is wetting his pants in fear. He doesn't have time to scream and takes a kick to the face. Now the barbarian is going to get out of there. Bjorn takes the keys from the unconscious guard and the other prisoners ask to be freed. The barbarian knows that many of them are criminals, but that doesn't matter and he begins to release them. Someone knocks on the guild of explorers door and it explodes with hundreds of prisoners escaping. The guild employees offer a reward for whoever captures the fugitives, and the battle begins. Bjorn takes advantage of the confusion, and climbs the stairs to get something. He encounters guards on the upper floor, and uses the flesh explosion again. This time his pieces fall on the prisoners and the barbarian activates the seal of sacrifice. His physical attributes increase with the number of those hit, and even trying, no guard can stop the barbarian. One of them strikes Bjorn with a sword and immediately the wound begins to heal. The guard takes a punch and falls face first to the ground. The guards are afraid. An explorer shouldn't be so strong. Ultimately none of them can defeat the barbarian. Bjorn finally got where he wanted. Bjorn arrived at the office of the guild's branch manager, and the guy was waiting for him. As soon as he enters, 
the barbarian realizes he fell into a trap. The manager attacks the barbarian with a sword and feels victorious. But suddenly the barbarian's blood that fell on the manager's face starts to burn. The manager screams in pain due to the acidic blood, then a scream catches Bjorn by surprise. There's a girl in the manager's office. Judging by her clothes, she's not an explorer. The branch manager reveals that the girl is the daughter of the district manager. He tries to argue with the barbarian, but is instantly defeated. With the girl there, Bjorn's plans change, and she keeps talking, suggesting that the barbarian was already planning something with her. Bjorn calls the guards and orders them to bring the interrogator, the leader of the looters guild, and a mage from the Tower of Magic, while using the girl as a hostage. The barbarian goes to the guild's balcony, takes a deep breath, and roars so that everyone below can hear him. Bjorn introduces himself and claims to be a rank 9 explorer who was framed and nearly executed by the guild, making a point to declare his innocence. After creating this commotion, the guild wouldn't be able to cover up his case. In the imposing Tower of Magic, a mage informs that someone is causing trouble in one of the guild's branches. The mage called to resolve the situation is none other than Raven, who was in the rupture with Bjorn. The mage also mentions that a guy took the branch manager's daughter as a hostage, and Raven thinks that guy must be really dumb to have done that. She agrees to go, curious to meet this crazy person. The barbarian is shocked. He didn't expect them to send a mage he knew, and she also didn't expect to see him in that situation. He asks the mage to check his memories to prove his innocence, saying there isn't much time. In return, she says he will owe her a favor. She approaches to use the magic, but the spell seems to have no effect, and the mage asks if he's wearing any magic resistance equipment. At that moment, the interrogator arrives to see how the guild manager is doing, and he is surprised to see that it was the barbarian who caused that turmoil. The the interrogator says that all of this is Bjorn's fault, and the guild manager wants to know why the interrogator didn't call a mage to make sure if Bjorn was guilty or not. The manager wants to know if there is any evidence that the barbarian is a looter, and according to the guy, the large amount of magic crystals and the equipment Bjorn had were very strange for a low-rank explorer. Using the communication stone that was with Bjorn, the interrogator contacted a guy who said the barbarian was a looter. The barbarian says that this guy's testimony wasn't even very verified with magic, and even the manager wants to know why the interrogator didn't confirm if the information was real. The interrogator loses patience, and shouts that Bjorn is lying, that it would be impossible for him to have absorbed the essence of a vampire he found in the first floor rupture. The barbarian might have lied because he knew magic didn't work against him, and the interrogator wasn't going to bring a mage from the tower for someone of low rank. With a bored face, the mage confirms Bjorn's story, leaving the interrogator and the manager speechless. The mage says she was there, but it's impossible to use magic on her to prove what she says. The interrogator can't believe it. He says the mage is lying, and she asks if she was called a liar, showing that the guy has much less power than she does. The interrogator kneels down, apologizing. The mages are as powerful as the aristocrats and protect themselves through their own organization. Now the guild manager starts to interfere because the story seems very strange. The mage agrees that a vampire never appeared on the first floor, but as the guild manager, he shouldn't be so incredulous because the mysteries of the labyrinth have not yet been completely unraveled, and it's impossible to predict what happens there. So he shouldn't be sure that a vampire wouldn't appear on the first floor. Bjorn sees that even in front of some Someone powerful. The mage is ruthless. Someone else enters the room. The guy introduces himself as Nile. He is the father of the barbarian's hostage, the district manager. Each branch of the Explorer's Guild has a manager, and above them is a district manager, who is only below the Guild Master. A guy is thrown into the room, and the Guild Manager says they were looking for this Explorer. Seeing who the person is, the interrogator is shocked. Bjorn takes a look at the scared guy, saying that it was him who gave the false testimony. The mage uses a spell on the guy and confirms that he was lying. Then the guild manager says that the barbarian is innocent. Bjorn releases the manager's daughter and wants to know what will happen to the liar. According to the manager, he and his clan will be investigated. The interrogator is fired and starts to complain, which only worsens the situation, since the manager says that every case he handled will be investigated, and if there's anything wrong, the interrogator 
interrogator will still be punished. The manager says that Bjorn will be rewarded, will be promoted to rank 7, and will receive new equipment, which makes the barbarian boiling with anger because he could have achieved the promotion with a rank 5 essence that he already has. According to the manager, Bjorn is still very inexperienced, and the barbarian calls for a rank 7 explorer to fight him and show that he is stronger. Raven intervenes to help. She says that it is the first time an explorer has faced a rank 5 vampire and even returns with the essence of the guardian vampire. The promotion is something that Bjorn would normally receive for that. The manager doesn't like it and asks what the barbarian will want. Bjorn, not being stupid, asks for 5 million crystals, and unexpectedly, the manager agrees to the amount, taking advantage. The mage also asks for a million for her work. Back at the magic tower, Bjorn is in the mage's laboratory, which is quite messy. She gives him a strange liquid to drink, saying it's just water. Bjorn sits down and asks why he was brought to the laboratory, and she says she's collecting on the favor he promised when he asked the mage to check his memories. The barbarian says he'll only do it if it's something he can do and the mage reveals that she wants to study him. Raven says that the research can be useful to both of them. Studying a vampire that had never appeared is a unique opportunity for her. Bjorn remembers they signed some papers, not to talk about the guild incident, and the mage said she would sign if they didn't tell that Bjorn absorbed the essence of the vampire. She just wanted no one to know to be able to research the barbarian. The mage asks him to come to the laboratory once a week for six months. The barbarian disagrees, and the mage retorts that he is only alive and got 5 million because of her, so he should be grateful. This only makes the barbarian say that she owes him, which leaves Raven confused. Bjorn stares at the mage and says he absorbed the essence of the body golem against his will because of her. To Raven, he should be grateful for getting the essence, but the barbarian says he was forced to consume the essence so that the mage would survive. Even though she did it to save Bjorn, he says he didn't want the essence, and the mage owes him. The mage thinks the barbarian has gone mad. Bjorn continues to insist that he was harmed by the essence, even with the mage explaining that the essence was very rare and explorers would pay dearly for it. Bjorn tells her to consult other explorers because they would agree with him. The mage thinks Bjorn said that because he thought she didn't know other explorers. She touches a crystal ball and contacts another explorer, after explaining the whole situation. The mage looks apprehensive, waiting for the response, and her contact says he would be very angry if it were him, satisfying the barbarian with the answer. Raven is surprised and tries to say that if the essence were very rare and could only be obtained in a rupture, it would be worth it. Her contact says he would be angry, demoralizing the mage. According to him, Mages wouldn't understand the situation and Bjorn is triumphant with the answer. Defeated, the mage asks how she could compensate someone if something like that happened. The guy replies that he would ask for 15 million if it were him, much more than the mage could expect. It seems erasing an essence is very expensive, and every time the explorer does it, it gets more expensive. Raven probably doesn't have all that money, and she asks what could serve as an alternative. But in this case, her contact says he would split the person's head. Raven doesn't know how to deal with this situation. This contact of hers must surely be powerful, since he is close to a tower mage, and must know how important the balance between essences is. If the mage had asked a low-ranked explorer, they would say any essence is good for them. Now, Bjorn wants to know if she will admit she was wrong. The elder mage appears, saying the barbarian must indeed be special to have won over a mage without using brute force. He introduces himself as the Iron and says he is Raven's mentor, and Bjorn is shocked, as this means this old man is very powerful. He is the master of the magic school. The elder enjoyed the conversation between the two. Even though Raven used the soundproof spell, it seems he was curious as to why she brought a barbarian alive. This part about being alive makes Bjorn curious, and the mage explains, with a scary face, that usually only the bodies or the hearts of the barbarians reach the tower. Bjorn surely didn't like to hear that. Then the mage starts laughing and says it was just a joke. If this is the mage's humor, Bjorn will show him what barbarian jokes are like. The barbarian says he should crack the mage's skull, catching him off guard with the joke. Bjorn tells the old man to accept that he fell for the barbarian's joke, but it seems calling the guy an old man was a mistake. The barbarian starts messing with the mage's head, saying it was another joke to call him an old man. And since the mage doesn't respond, Bjorn thinks he went too far with the joke. The mage starts laughing, 
saying Bjorn is a true barbarian, while saying he doesn't mind being teased. His expression says otherwise, he seems to be boiling with anger. To fix the situation, Bjorn jokingly says the mage takes jokes very well, as if he has a bit of barbarian blood. Back to business, the mage has something to offer Bjorn instead of money, he offers the frozen spirit ring number 9425. By the barbarian's reaction, this numbered item means it is very rare. It can only be obtained by defeating rupture guardians, and has a unique ability. It's strange they offered such an item so easily. Bjorn wants to know what makes the ring special, and according to the mage, the item can seal one of the essences the user has absorbed. The mage says the ring could seal the essence of the body golem that the barbarian consumed against his will. It seems Bjorn knows some hidden ability of this item, which not even the mage knows, and he accepts the trade. Before the barbarian leaves the tower, Raven asks him not to forget to come back because he promised to help with her research. The girl apologizes for making the mage give a numbered item to Bjorn, but according to Dian, it was just a useless item, worth only one and a half million crystals, and he thinks the barbarian will be angry when he finds out. As he leaves the tower, Bjorn thinks that, in that world, mages are the smartest people. Still, Raven didn't know about the hidden item in the rupture and from that, he was sure he is much superior, even to the mages who have no idea of the real value of the item they gave him. After a long time, Bjorn returns to the inn and the owner is surprised because he thought the barbarian was no longer in this world. The guy explains that he threw Bjorn's things away because he thought the barbarian wouldn't come back. Bjorn is furious because he had paid for an extra week's stay and the guy says he will compensate Bjorn. The barbarian holds himself back from doing anything to the guy. The next day, he goes to a trading district with Einar. There he sells the items he got in the labyrinth and pays Einar's 300,000 stones, which she is grateful for the payment. She tells Bjorn that there are people eating clouds on a stick and, looking at them, she feels like trying it too. Einar finds humans amazing for creating something like that while enjoying a meal with the barbarian. A little shy, she thanks Bjorn for still treating her the same way, even though her body has changed. Impossible for Bjorn not to find her cute now. Einar says that the other barbarians started avoiding her because she no longer looked like a warrior. Besides, humans started flirting with her everywhere. Einar is desperate with this change of appearance, and asks the barbarian if she really became so ugly. Bjorn is completely speechless. The girl looks wonderful. She tells Bjorn that she made a decision. She can't enter the labyrinth with the barbarian anymore. Bjorn was left alone. Now Einar is no longer part of his group and not because of her change in appearance, but because her talents were noticed by an elder, a fencing specialist, and she decided to learn fencing with this mentor. The barbarian asks if she couldn't at least leave one day free to go to the labyrinth, but special training won't let Einar leave the temple for six months. It seems Bjorn knows this training and, if it's what he's thinking, it will be a great opportunity for her. Einar doesn't ask the barbarian to wait for her to come back or to let her join the group again, but she promises she will return as a powerful warrior who won't be a burden to him. Bjorn thinks that, after everything his companion went through in the labyrinth, being forced to surrender to the plunderer, swearing by her honor and having no power to do anything in the rupture, she can't bear so much humiliation as a warrior. Now the barbarian needs to decide if he will find another companion, or go alone to the labyrinth, since he has become stronger. With the two essences he absorbed, and considering that his attributes have increased significantly, Bjorn is now stronger than any explorer on the second floor. From the third floor onward, things get difficult, and even though he's strong, there's no way to clear a floor alone. The higher the floor level, the more necessary it becomes to have a group, preferably with members of similar levels. While thinking about this, the barbarian goes to Raven. A mage like her would be a great addition to his group. When the barbarian is about to invite her to the group, she shows him a scary chair for her research in Bjorn. It doesn't seem like anyone has survived it. The mage declines Bjorn's offer without thinking twice. She would only consider accepting if the barbarian recruited other rank 6 members, including a priest. She knows it would be very complicated for the barbarian to recruit these members now. Changing the subject, the mage hands him the result of the vampire essence analysis. Her results are not very detailed, but that doesn't matter to the barbarian who knows exactly what the essence does. And being a guardian essence, it comes with a passive ability that, in this case, makes him resistant to death. Adding the immortal seal and the essence, Bjorn can heal from any wound. Before Bjorn leaves, 
The mage asks him one thing, she wants to know what Bjorn put in the vampire's mouth while they were fighting. Bjorn knows she's talking about the tear of the goddess, but he decides to play dumb and not say anything about it. To avoid more questions from the mage, he says he's hungry and leaves. Raven is sure he knows something and won't stop until she finds out what it is. In the tower's library, she picks up a book about ruptures, which contains information about the blood-dyed castle. The book talks about the tear of the goddess and the golden mask, but it's hard to know much because the pages are stained. The mage looks up information about the tear in another book and finds out that it's a consumable relic that spreads a very strong blessing when the vial is broken. It's been over a century since the relic was last used to save the Pope. Discovering this, Raven wonders if it was a coincidence that what happened in the battle resembled the power of this relic. If it wasn't a coincidence, it would be very strange for the barbarian to know about the tear's location and how to use it. By defeating the ruptured boss, Bjorn obtained the golden mask. It can be used five times, and it makes the user change their face for a month. In the game, the barbarian didn't pay much attention to the item and sold it. But after being unjustly imprisoned, this item could be very useful to Bjorn in the future. In a tavern, people are talking about the guild the plunderers were part of being dissolved and Erwin's sister, who was eating, listens attentively to this gossip. The guild was called Crystal Union and had grown a lot in the last decade. Its members used a communication system with many message stones. One of the guys talking says they weren't even explorers. It seems that at first this guild was made up of common people who needed to pay their taxes. But as they grew, they began to discriminate against outsiders and committed crimes against beginners. After hearing the conversation, Rowan's sister leaves. She remembers everything Erwin went through because of those plunderers. Before leaving she also hears that it was the freedom barbarian who dissolved the guild. People are talking about a barbarian who escaped from prison to prove his innocence. And the most incredible thing about it is that this barbarian was only a rank 9 explorer. By the information, it would be too much of a coincidence for this barbarian to be Bjorn. But it would explain why Bjorn disappeared for a week. The elf goes to Erwin's room and calls for her sister. The girl doesn't seem well surrounded by her spirits and her sister isn't sure if she should tell Owen about what she heard earlier. In the Explorer's Guild, Bjorn is looking for members for a group. The Barbarian wants at least four people who work from the third floor up, and the attendant asks for the Barbarian's information. As soon as he starts reading, the guy gets scared and says something about five stars. But when Bjorn asks, he plays dumb and hands over a list of teams for the Barbarian. Bjorn realizes the guy changed the subject, but he didn't pay much attention. Analyzing the list, he finds an interesting name. It was Murad's name, the dwarf who entered the rupture with Bjorn. The dwarf says he invited one more person to join them and the barbarian is surprised when he hears that a mage would join them. The dwarf starts waving. The new member of the group is arriving. The mage seems young and excited. He introduces himself as Ryal and says he wants to join the barbarian's group. Murad introduces himself as a 6th rank explorer and the mage is an 8th rank from the royal family. This surprises the dwarf, and Bjorn explains that this means the mage doesn't work for the guild. Ryal thinks Bjorn seems clever for his kind and asks the barbarian's name. Bjorn is getting annoyed with the mage but introduces himself and asks Ryal to sit with them. Bjorn asks why the mage wants to explore the labyrinth. It seems rare for an 8th rank mage to go on explorations. Due to the mage's rank, he must not be very strong and would only be able to explore the lower floors, so it would be much more profitable to work in the city. The mage says he wants to become a renowned explorer to bring glory to Baron Martoyne's family. The dwarf is surprised that the mage is a noble, but apparently, he is just a distant relative. Ryal also says he won't mistreat anyone for having an inferior position, but he's not a real noble either. Despite being cute, this mage only knows a few curse and ice spells that could be useful to the group, meaning he's quite weak, but Bjorn accepts him into the group. Just the fact of having a mage will attract more powerful explorers. As the barbarian expected, after the mage joined, they received proposals from several strong explorers, and Bjorn and the dwarf started analyzing them. From the dwarf's expression, they found another member, and now their team is complete. Bjorn upgrades his equipment before entering the labyrinth and shows the new armor to the librarian, who shows no reaction. She just asks what it is, and Bjorn excitedly says he bought lithium armor and shield and an expanding backpack that allows him to carry much more stuff. The librarian only says they received complaints, 
and it's better for the barbarian to take off the armor. She really doesn't like Bjorn's antics. Walking down the street, Bjorn spots a barbarian huddled in a corner. The guy is without any weapon, which is very strange because no matter how poor or hungry a barbarian is, they always have a weapon as if it were part of their body. Bjorn tries to talk to the guy, and the other barbarian seems very scared. Bjorn tells him not to be afraid and asks where his weapon is. The guy says, still frightened, that he was broke and so sold his weapon. Bjorn gives a big smile to the guy, thinking about how strange it was for a barbarian to sell their own weapon. Bjorn introduces himself, and the guy says his name is Terrakin. Bjorn takes Terrakin to eat. Bjorn is sure that this barbarian is what they call an evil spirit in this world, someone who didn't come from this world. Terrakin is very grateful to Bjorn. He says he went through the coming-of-age ceremony a month before Bjorn did. Terrakin tells that he got lost and couldn't enter the labyrinth, but Bjorn thinks he got scared of the monsters and ran away. It wouldn't be difficult for the guy to have escaped from the barbarians. His problem would start afterward because no one in the city would want to employ a barbarian. Bjorn wonders if this guy wasn't playing and had also reached the boss's room in the game. But if that were the case, he would know how barbarians are treated in this world. So he asks what Terrakin did after the labyrinth opened the other month, and the guy says he didn't go back in. Bjorn gets annoyed. How could the guy miss the chance again? But Terrakin tries to explain that this time he didn't even have a weapon because he had sold his. The guy didn't think about the future, and Bjorn is confused if the guy really played the game. After that, the guy went hungry, cold, and was rejected by the barbarians when he tried to get close. Bjorn wonders how he survived for so long if he had fled when he came to this world. Just like Terrakin did, he could have ended up the same way. Terrakin asks if Bjorn doesn't feel bad and wants to help him. He excitedly says he knows the labyrinth and could help. But Bjorn interrupts him, saying he won't go to the labyrinth with him. This takes all the excitement out of Terrakin. But Bjorn says he will help the guy in another way. Bjorn offers 150,000 stones and tells Terrakin to buy a weapon and enter the labyrinth. The guy takes the coins trembling, and Bjorn tells him to leave because he's tired. Terrakin tries to say he'll repay, but Bjorn interrupts, saying he should leave. No matter what happens from now on, Bjorn doesn't want to see the guy ever again and asks if the guy understood what he said. The barbarian seems like a different person, scary. At home, the barbarian thinks he acted horribly with the guy. But thinking about what he lived in the labyrinth, he thinks he acted the best way he could with Terrakin and hopes the guy survives exploring that place. The day to enter the labyrinth arrives, and the mage is excited. It's his first time entering, and he's curious about every detail of the place. The other group member appears. His name is Braun, and he's 7th rank with 8 years as an explorer. The guy knows what he's doing. Murad is also excited because he hasn't explored with the group in a long time, and finally, the last one to join the group. The semi-human explorer, 7th rank Nisha, who has 5 years of experience, she is eager to destroy some monsters. The dwarf jokes, calling her a princess, and she gets mad. It seems she's royalty from some tribe. With this lineup, Bjorn's new group enters the labyrinth. With Bronn's help, the group reaches the second floor in a few hours. But the navigator isn't satisfied since they weren't the first to reach the second floor. Braun has the orientation skill, which shows the direction to reach the portal, which is very useful for the team. Bjorn just doesn't like that this way. He doesn't gain by opening the portal. With Einar or Erwin, he could have opened the portal and gained experience points. But until he has a trustworthy team, it's better not to show everything he knows. On the second floor, they enter the beast den. The dwarf asks how the wizard is feeling, and due to the bad smell of the place, Ryal is almost vomiting. Bjorn remembers that Braun has a scent type essence and asks how he's feeling. But unlike the wizard, the explorer is not affected by the smell. Braun warns the group to be careful not to step on the waste puddles, and they continue through the valley. The beast then doesn't have traps, but due to its layout, it's very easy to get lost. The monsters they encounter are easily defeated by the team, and with the wizard's magical alarm, they can take four guard shifts, allowing each to sleep for six hours. It seems that this time, exploring the labyrinth will be much smoother. Ryal doesn't understand why one of them has to stay on guard if they have the magical alert. The problem is that this magic only detects monsters, and explorers are much harder to detect. Knowing this makes the wizard scared, and the dwarf suggests Ryal should rest. 
The barbarian wakes up to the conversation and thinks this might be the wizard's first and last time with the team. On the second day, Bronze says they are approaching the portal to the third floor, where rank 7 and 8 monsters are. The third floor, called the Pilgrim's Passage, is much larger than the others, and even though they might appear in different parts of the floor, all explorers will be together, unlike what happens on the second floor. Misha asks Bjorn if he has been to the third floor before and mentions it took her a year to reach there. Both she and the dwarf took about two years to reach the fourth floor. Misha makes fun of the dwarf because she is more experienced than him. If that's the case, the barbarian is ascending the floors very quickly. Suddenly, Braun tells them to stop joking around, and Bjorn thinks he looks even more annoyed, which could be understandable since he's doing all the work, but he continues to be annoying. They enter the third floor, barely stepping onto it when they hear a loud noise. Bjorn shouts for Braun to move away, and several monsters start running toward the group. The barbarian holds off the attack with his shield, finding it very odd to have monsters waiting right in front of the portal. Even using his shield, Bjorn realizes these monsters are very strong. On the other side, the dwarf is struggling to hold off the creatures. His shield starts to break, and he has to use his skill to repair it. Murad mentions the monsters are called Iantro, resembling boars, and are rank 7. The balance of weight ability the dwarf has was acquired by absorbing the essence of one of these monsters. The wizard casts a curse on one of them. Taking advantage of the opening, the dwarf lunges at the monster and hits its head. To finish off the other one, Misha uses Bjorn as a springboard and leaps onto the other creature, eager for a chance to get an essence. These monsters don't usually appear in this location. So Bjorn asks Braun if there are humans nearby. He activates his heat body sensor ability but doesn't detect any human presence nearby. However, he notes that by the smell, there were humans there not long ago, and Bjorn thinks they must have fled after seeing the group fighting. The dwarf is shocked that someone might have been waiting for them, and Braun clarifies that they weren't specifically waiting for them. Many plunderers attract monsters near portals, knowing that this is a vulnerable moment for explorers. Misha suggests they should find and defeat these plunderers. She heard there's a reward if they do. The team discusses that it would be difficult to find the plunderers now, and Ryal seems quite shaken by the plunderer's story. The dwarf thinks the best they can do is put a warning on the second floor portal, and the wizard is trembling. A pity he's so weak. The group comments that it's incredible that Braun knows about plunderer's strategies, since it's not common to encounter them. Curious. Bjorn asks how many times Misha has encountered plunderers, and according to her, it's only about 8 times in 5 years, which is almost nothing, considering Bjorn has encountered plunderers 5 times in 3 months. She and the dwarf laugh at the barbarian's bad luck. According to the dwarf, it used to be common to encounter so many plunderers over a century ago. Maybe it's Bjorn's bad luck that they keep encountering plunderers. Braun defends the barbarian mentioning he encounters plunderers every three months. Bjorn is still upset. He's the only one who encounters plunderers so frequently. After defeating a few more monsters, they find a quieter place to camp. Murad, who noticed the wizard isn't well, asks if something happened. The wizard seems very disheartened. Ryal explains that his idea of being an explorer was shattered. He knows he may seem naive and spoiled to others. But knowing there are explorers who attack other explorers, who want to eliminate each other for money, is very difficult for him. If he continues on this path, he knows he'll end up killing someone, and that's why he was preparing himself. Bjorn wants to know if he's prepared now, and the wizard confidently says yes, even though he doesn't know if he'll really be able to when the time comes. The barbarian knows Ryal didn't have enough confidence, but it's better to lie and pretend to be strong. Braun tells the wizard that it's important not to be arrogant. It's much better to be like that and asks the group if he can show them something. The group is impressed with the view that Braun showed them, a beautiful and bright landscape that can only be seen at this time of day and only on the third floor. The wizard is enchanted by what he's seeing, and perhaps that gave him a little more courage to continue exploring the labyrinth. After night falls, everyone goes to sleep except for Bjorn who stays on guard, and the barbarian notices that the wizard takes a while to fall asleep. The view must have really changed his impression of the labyrinth. The group resumes exploration, and according to Bjorn's calculations, he still needs another 100 experience points to reach level 4. On level 3, he can absorb up to 3 essences, 
Since there's still space for one more, he's not in a hurry to level up but wants to absorb a good essence. Braun warns that the group has reached the orc's habitat, the area with the highest number of monsters on the third floor, where only rank 8 or higher monsters appear. If they don't go to the fourth floor, this is the best place they have for hunting. The dwarf thinks it's best for them to fight together, and depending on how they progress, they will decide what to do next. He barely finishes speaking when a band of orcs appears, coming toward them, and Bjorn's group prepares for the battle. Ryal casts a spell of ice spears that precisely hits an orc's forehead, while Bjorn and the dwarf hold off attacks at close range. Misha takes care of the orcs that manage to pass through them, and the wizard and Braun attack from a distance. The team seem to be doing well until an orc sorcerer appears. He casts the berserk magic on his comrades, increasing the resistance of the warrior orcs by 300% for 10 seconds, which doesn't seem like much. But the orc becomes incredibly strong and manages to break through Bjorn and Murad's shields. The barbarian shouts to Braun that one of the orcs got through, and Braun tries to protect the wizard with his shield, receiving a massive blow from the orc. The group needs to organize to protect the physically weaker wizard. The 10 seconds of strength for the orc end, and Misha appears behind him for a sneak attack, defeating the monster. Seizing the opportunity, Bjorn attacks their sorcerer, who falls without even being able to react. The group is satisfied. They manage to defeat the orcs without getting injured. Reflecting on the battle, Bjorn thinks they are taking a bit longer to win, but they are still balanced. He believes they make a good team the way they are. The team advances toward the center of the orcs' habitat, and the closer they get, the more orcs appear in their path. They encounter a large rank 7 orc warrior, and even this monster is easily defeated by them. But things don't continue to be easy, something explodes, and the group narrowly avoids it. A guy appears in front of them, hopefully not another raider. The guy says that that orc habitat is the territory of the Zawi clan, and the group should go explore somewhere else. In the game, there were some ways to restrict an area, but since it was very difficult, it would only be worth it if it were a boss or rare monster habitat. The dwarf asks what this clan is doing there, since they usually hunt on the sixth floor, and the clan chief refuses to answer. Murad gets angry. He has never heard that this habitat is the Zawi clan's territory, and accuses them of not even being part of the clan for real. The guy looks at Murad, nervous. It seems either of them wants to resolve the situation peacefully. Bjorn notices that Misha has shrunk behind him and asks what happened. Then someone calls the girl a black sheep. She seems terrified. Misha calls the guy Brother Taylor, and they do look alike. He gets annoyed and says she shouldn't call him that in public. It's embarrassing. And the elder asks if they are really siblings. It's impossible not to be with such resemblance. It seems the elder owes something to this clan. But Taylor doesn't care if he has to fight her or not. The Elder thinks it's best to tell the group why the clan is there. They are looking for the essence of the great orc warrior, and after finding it, they will leave. This isn't a rare essence, but Bjorn seems to know something that would make it very special. The Elder emphasizes that it's better for them to leave. With the clan there, there won't be monsters for the group to hunt. Since they are weaker, Bjorn thinks it's pointless to force their way into the habitat. The barbarian is about to say they will leave, but out of nowhere, the wizard says he will handle the situation. Ryal takes the lead and introduces himself, but the elder says he's just trash, leaving the wizard speechless. The guy didn't need to be so cruel. The guy didn't like being called a senior wizard and humiliates Ryal, telling him never to be called that again, and Ryal still hasn't found words to reply. He was destroyed by the elder. Murad gets involved in the conversation, calling the guy rude. The elder says he only spoke the truth, and the dwarf can't stay quiet. He activates his lightning ability, ready to fight with a sixth floor clan. Everything the barbarian tried to avoid happened. Now the group will have to fight against the sixth floor clan, thanks to Murad, who couldn't let the mage be humiliated. The elder glares angrily at the dwarf, and Bjorn shouts Murad's name while punching the dwarf's head to the ground. The whole group is taken aback by the barbarian's actions, who continues holding the dwarf, telling him to calm down. Bjorn looks at the clan, hoping to have avoided worse, and the elder says the dwarf should be grateful for having a companion like the barbarian. It seems Bjorn managed to prevent the group from being destroyed. Near the exit of the orc habitat, the dwarf apologizes for his actions, saying he acted without thinking. Bronn says the dwarf's actions could have ended them, but since nothing happened, it's best to forget it. As bad as Murad acted, he was defending his companion. 
The barbarian thinks Bronn should have been tougher on him, and is too kind to be a leader. In Bronn's place, Bjorn would still be cursing the dwarf. Misha thinks it was her fault that things didn't go well, but for the mage, she was the reason nothing worse happened, as she is the sister of one of the clan members. This cheers the girl up, and Bjorn is puzzled by how quickly the group's atmosphere improved. Misha reveals she doesn't talk much about her family because she's ashamed of being the only one who couldn't form a bond with a spirit beast. Demi-humans like her can make contracts with ancient beasts, the spirit beasts. There are several types of contracts that allow summoning beasts, being possessed by them, or using their abilities, and not all demi-humans can make these contracts. In Misha's case, because she descends from the Karlstein family, it's shameful that she doesn't have a contract. When she was a child, she got along well with her siblings, but as she grew up and wasn't chosen by any beasts, she was rejected by them and called a half-breed. To her siblings, she is the result of an affair, and since her mother died early, she couldn't confirm, so she left the clan and learned to fight, thus becoming an explorer. The dwarf is moved by her story and how difficult her life must have been. The barbarian doesn't understand how the dwarf could be so moved. And now the dwarf also wants to tell his story. Murad's dream was to be a blacksmith. Every dwarf must want that. But even trying for 10 years, he couldn't graduate because he had no talent. So, at 30 years old and needing to survive, he became an explorer. Now it's the mage's turn to say he's the least talented. He only had contact with magic due to his social position, but wasn't good enough to enter the magic tower. Ryal thinks that if he were a true mage, he would have been a little more respected by the Elder. The Dwarf is moved again, saying Ryal is a great mage. The Elder was wrong about him. Beside the Barbarian, Bronn says it's the first time he's seen something like this. And Bjorn thinks he agrees that all that emotion is unnecessary. But instead, Bronn says he also needs to apologize. Bronn says he got angry when Murad and Misha were talking about their experiences because he envied them. He thought that since they weren't human, they were lucky and didn't suffer. To cheer Braun up, the dwarf and Misha say that only humans can become mages or even saints, only not mentioning that only a small part of humans can have these talents. The dwarf laughs, saying the team is formed only by black sheep, and everyone feels better after talking about their problems and being comforted, except for one. Everyone looks at the barbarian, waiting for him to also tell his story. Bjorn is in panic. He doesn't know what to say in this situation. So the barbarian takes a deep breath and shouts with all his might that he has no mother. The dwarf and the mage stare at him, still surprised by the outburst. And Bjorn continues shouting that his mother didn't survive after childbirth. And his father never returned from the labyrinth. So he can't meet them even if he wants to. The group falls silent after the confession. Since Einar told this story to Bjorn, he didn't lie about his parents. Bronn and Misha are deeply moved. The mage starts crying, and the dwarf even says he can be a father figure to Bjorn. But he doesn't want any emotions and says he's fine. Still, now the group is in tears over the barbarian's story. Misha is worried and asks if Bjorn is okay. He started thinking about how many times he almost died since he ended up in this world, and that really upset him. While the barbarian is downcast, Murad tells Bronn that they should go to the witch's forest. This catches Bjorn's attention. They discuss where they should go, and for Murad, it's better to continue on the third floor and improve their teamwork a little more before going up. Since the witch's forest is a very difficult place, Bjorn thinks the dwarf wants to go there to test how they work as a team in a much more dangerous place. On the fourth floor, monsters of rank 7 and 8 appear, like on the third, but also rank 6 monsters rarely. Which means that, being on that floor, monsters of this rank can appear at any time. Bjorn has lost the game several times on this floor and understands why the dwarf is cautious, but still thinks it's better for the group to move to the fourth floor. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on upcoming videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed it and share with your friends. See you in the next video. Bye for now.